First clap out the gate on three. Okay, I almost wasn't recording. <laughs> One, two, three. What's up, everybody? Welcome to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're so glad that you're here. As always, I am your host, Lauren Ash. And as always, I am joined by my co-hostess with the most S, Christy Oxborough. How you doing? I'm riding a very high sugar high. <laughs> hey, that's fun. I'm enjoying it. I'm having a good time. I, uh, I, I, it was another one of those like down to the wire. Am I going to get this done in time? And the sugar said, you bet your ass you can. And <laughs> I ended up finishing then like earlier than I thought. And then was in that awkward space of like, well, I've got like have an like I have enough time it's just pointless to sit there and do nothing but I have not enough time to really get into something deep so I'm like so what am I gonna do I guess the answer is take my kid to football practice <laughs> that's what I'm gonna do it's fine it rained it's oh. the season it's what you do do they practice in the rain yes ah as long as there's not lightning it's fair game Oh God, that sounds yeah. terrible. Usually with the younger ones, they will like cut practice early or something if it's like pouring and it rained like all day and then beautiful, bright blue sky, birds chirping. And I was like, let's get in the car. This is great. And as we were a block away, gray cloud rained down. And I was like, he's in shorts. I didn't bring him a coat. I, I just bought an umbrella. It's at home. This is not ideal. And yeah. so I made him get changed in the car because usually you change out the shoes and stuff outside. But I was like, no, we're doing it in the car. And then it just went to like barely raining and we started. So it wasn't bad. But yeah, if there's lightning, you have to leave the field for 15 minutes until you haven't seen more lightning. Then you can come back out. Oh, because lightning's on a timer. Well, I don't, that's the science it's, to it. It's is it? the it's the weird rule for every time you see lightning, you have to get off the field and stand somewhere specific, and you stand there and you wait at least fifteen minutes before you go back out. But if it lightnings at some point in there, you gotta st stay back and go fifteen again, and it's it's a lot. Yeah, but I will take that over football in the fall where that rain turns into snow mid game that uh there's a trauma there you know oh yeah yep yep nobody needs that no um well on a brighter note uh i haven't spoken to you uh in the flesh or on the screen i guess you could say yeah uh and in since i needed to wish you a congratulations on your recent award wins <laughs> Which are also your recent award wins. <laughs> they are. They are. <laughs> but, you know, come on. Um, two awards, and the, the Communicator Awards. And I here's why I'm jazzed. I'm jazzed always about any sort of uh, recognition. That, that's so nice. But this is why these ones feel special to me. One, are, we got an award of excellence for best podcast hosts. Hey. And that's nice. That is nice. Right? And then we got an award of distinction for best entertainment podcast episode. And the episode was, dear listeners, The Glee Curse. <laughs> it's a romp and an award winner. I Jeez. was, now I can say both. Yes. You listen to The Glee Curse. It's an award winning romp. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like that. Right? Oh, they're going to ask for merch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's probably going to happen. But, you know, I think it's very special because to me, when anyone ever asks me about like, what's an episode of the show that you think best encapsulates what you do? I say, I jokes aside, I do say the Glee curse because we have, if you haven't listened to it, what are you doing? And um, we have an amazing, the, the most we've ever derailed is in that episode. Oh, we, we yeah. We talk about Jay. So, so you get peak chuckleheads. But yeah. then also- Christy compiled that episode herself. It isn't like she, there was like a documentary about the Glee curse that then we covered on the show. Sure. She created the documentary herself. That was what the podcast episode was. So to me, it's just like 
peak research, peak chuckleheads. What more do you want? And now, well, I'll tell you, not a lot because it, it's been recognized with a nice award. So there you go. So congratulations to you from me. Well, congratulations to you from me. I'll take that. I'll take that. Thank you. Um, now, before we say anything else, I got to ask, what you drinking over there? Are you nipping in? I might get into something in a bit. You know what I mean? Oh, uh, oh, I'm doing a water and uh, because I drove close to it on my way home from practice, I grabbed a Slurpee. Is it a lime one? It is. You're really on a lime kick these days. I am. And it's the reason is I am usually a very like, oh, okay. Yeah, whatever. Kind of a person when it comes to Slurpees. I'm like that not good enough. I am so specific. And if the Pepsi one isn't thick enough, if it's too runny, then I'm like not interested. The lime can be a little bit runny and it's still okay. But the Pepsi does not hold up if it's not. And there is one, we have two locations in town and one, the Pepsi just doesn't taste the same. So if I go to that one, I'm like, I get something else and thank God they had the lime and the, the lime's just nice. It's nice. Yes. At some point, I'm going to do a half and half because it's a nice Pepsi lime kind of thing. And then maybe just like a little vodka. Maybe like that's that. what I do. You know, like that's that's a refreshing summer drink. Oh, you know? God, yeah. Yes. Now, last week on the show, when we covered Bonnie and Clyde, I drank white wine for the first, well, I drank for the first time in some time. And yeah, less than a half a glass in. And I was feeling loose and buzzy. That was my quote, I believe. Yes. It uh, was. So I'm holding off at the moment, but I think maybe at the half I'll pour something. I just didn't want to, I didn't want to come out hot again. You know what I mean? I want to, I wanted to have my wits about me. So I got a diet Coke and a water right now, but I think in the, at the half, I'll just, I'll, that's when I'll start to just, you know, give myself a little. Okay. I, I like this energy already. And also yeah. I don't want you to ever fear about coming in hot. I hope that you bring up ass to ass every podcast. <laughs> yeah, see, that's the thing. It's not about coming in hot as much as it is about going out hot. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, you um, remember the end of it, don't you? I, yes, ish. Yes. I mean, good for yes. you because I don't. The second I, we're done, we hit stop and it deletes. Yes, I I, that's it know? for me too. Like it deletes like they all delete. Like I didn't black out. Let's put it that way. Let's put it that way. Because I remember the last call we recorded after. See, and I'd forgotten we had, and I was yep. sober, so. There you go. Um, now, again, uh, very quickly, I have not shared this with Christy yet, and I'm very excited to get her reaction in real time, uh, along with all of you at home uh, reacting in real time. Speaking of coming in hot. So I moved into my home uh, four years ago this summer, four years ago. Hey, and so there was a, there was and is a learning curve when you move into your first house. And it should also be noted, I grew up in uh, apartment buildings, townhouses, like I haven't ever lived in a house for any amount of time, other than when I was very, very young uh, and we lived with my grandparents. So um, I, when buying a house, I was like, I don't want any fixing. I don't want to have to, I don't want to fix her up or like, mm -hmm. I don't want to do any work. So the house that I bought was brand new. No one had ever lived in it. And I thought, this is it. This is going to, this is going to be the answer. What I learned was not the move. Uh, you need, I think ideally you want a house, maybe someone's lived in for like three to five years. That's a sweet spot because it's still very new, but someone's loved it. And, and taking care of all the bullshit at that point. Like oh, no. I had so much bullshit in this house when I moved in. For example, um, the house that was on this lot burned down and then a new house got built. And that is the house that I own. In California, Southern California, if you don't treat land uh, for pests, and I'm not talking the rodents, I'm talking the other ones, uh, you will have a problem. So for the first almost, I'd say eight to nine months I lived in this house, it was riddled <laughs> with the giant cockroaches. That don't live in houses. This is the thing. They don't, I've done a lot of research. They don't want to live in your house. They're, that's not ideal to them. They live outside. 
the point is, is that we disrupted them and they were on land that had not been treated for God knows how many years. So they were lost and guess where they were found? And the answer is in my home. Uh, so mm. we got that under control. Great. But then it's thing after thing after thing was what kind of kept kind of, kind of kept coming up for me. All of this to say, I bought nice patio furniture. I was like, I've got this big backyard. I've got the pool. I'm going to have, you know, a sectional back there with a matching coffee table and a dining room table and chairs yes. and a bench. I'm going to do the whole thing. So I dropped some cash on this. But because I'm someone who doesn't know how to, I'll say it, take care of things, I didn't realize that I should be treating the wood. Oh, no. And so this, like this past year, I was like, oh, this, and look, we also live in, in California here. And so it's, it's, the sun will damage things, but, but like, there's not a lot of rain typically. So, you know, and I take things in, in the rain, but the structure of the, the furniture, I couldn't take it. Long story short, I know I'm, I'm building this up way too much, but the whole point is I'm also, as everyone knows, an intensely busy woman. So I looked at the patio furniture the other day and I was like, God, this was, if you had only known you could have kept this nicer than it is. Like, it's really like, it's weathered. It's, it's been through weather for years. It hasn't sure. been properly taken care of, not due to laziness, truly due to, to ignorance. Didn't know, did not know. And so I started shopping for new furniture and then I went, no, you can't do that. You can't just give this away or sell it and buy new. You're better than that. You're more resourceful than that. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I've started to restore the wood. <laughs> and I don't know if it looks like my mouth is full, but I've bitten off more than I can chew. <laughs> I, I did a lot of research. Mm -hmm. I ordered a lot of products. Yeah. I have an orbital sander. Um, I've got drop cloths. I've got things to treat different kinds of sealants. I've got everything under the damn moon. Um, long story short, I, <laughs> there's also just like, there's just so much of it. Like there's so much kind of, you've seen the furniture. I mean, yeah. the people who've seen the California break photos, I think, I think people have seen pictures from back there. Like there's a, the, it's big. Yeah. I've estimated that if it goes at the speed I've been going, I think this is like between 45 and 60 hours of work, <laughs> which I don't have. I don't oh. have. And pool oh. season is almost upon us. Long story short, too late. I, today, I brought, I bought two different products to finish it to, to, for the, you know, I've done the sanding. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I'll, I'll try these two different ones. And one of the products stripped everything down off of it. So it changed to a completely different color. And then the other product just kind of like highlighted what was there. And I sent a picture to Mother Laurel, who I will add is impossibly giftedly handy at everything. She's sure. so good at this kind of stuff. Yeah. So I sent her the picture and I went, well, tried two different products. This is what happened. And she just wrote back, welp, choose one. <laughs> She's right. She's yeah. right. And then I just said, well, I don't really like either. I kind of thought maybe it would be glossier and it doesn't really look glossy. And how many coats do I have to do for it to be glossy? How thick do the coats need to be? Maybe I could just sand it again and prime it and then paint all of it. Prime it and paint all of it. Oh, I shouldn't be left alone with my thoughts is the point. This is a project that I don't have time for, bandwidth yeah. for, physical energy for, but we're in it now. So guess what? Buckle in. You'll get a weekly update. What did you do this week? Answer nothing or one chair leg. Oh boy. Look, first of all, I am incredibly proud that you were like, you know what? I'm going to do this myself. Uh, second, couldn't be happier that you chose to get a sander and aren't like sanding it just by hand. Like I assume it's a sander that turns on. Oh yeah. Well, thank God. That's, that's your next bet. I was also going to say, oh, God, when do I tell her there's different grits of sandpaper? Oh, yeah. Here's here's where I am about that. So the sander came in the mail before the sandpaper discs arrived. Sure. But good news, the sander had a disc, just a single one that came with it. So I was like, well, great, I can try this out. And it worked great. But nowhere on the box, the instructions or the sandpaper disc, does it say what the grit was? I, I, I don't know. 
so now I'm like, like a, am I going to have to read this like Braille? Like, am I going to have to try and compare it to other sandpapers? Like, I, I don't know. And I've also been using it. So it's also not going to be as sandy as it would normally be. Remember when you talked about jackhammering and I said, you don't need to do this yourself, hire somebody. Where were my own words? True. But I say we. I don't mean me. I mean, uh, my husband and my oldest son, we jackhammered. You did. And you did a great job. And it's gone. And now we have nothing but grass back there. And what a delight. And to be honest with you, I think that's what inspired me that I thought I could do this because I was such a naysayer when you started that project. And then I was, I was wrong. I was like, wow, they, they did it and they, they did a great job. And maybe I should take a page from that book. The well, I steered is, you the wrong way, <laughs> but you also had other people. Oh God. I'm, yeah. I'm going to end up. Yeah. I feel like I'm going to get this half done and then I'm just going to have to pay someone to do the rest. Here's the other thing. I used that sander. I timed it. Um, cause I wanted to see how long it would take to do the top of the coffee table out there for example. sure. It took me 15 minutes. Great. Um, I didn't regain feeling in my thumb for about four hours. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's a, yeah. it's, it's powerful. That thing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a, it's a good quality sander. It's a, it's a black and Decker, which is a, which is a brand I trust. (laughs) I, I, I like hearing any brand that you trust in tools when I, I, I didn't know if you ever used any, I couldn't be prouder of what you're doing right now. And look, I get the idea of like buy a house brand new. Because then you come in and it's fresh and you know it's fine. I, I have uh, twice moved to different houses as an adult. As a kid, it's a whole other experience where the adults yeah. are dealing with all the bullshit that you don't know about. And you're just pouting uh, about having to move. But as an adult, I moved in with my then boyfriend, now husband, And then we ended up (laughs) having too many kids for the house. So we moved again. Um, Surprises. There are surprises when you move into somebody else's home. Like the simple thing of doing a quick walkthrough uh, with your realtor on the day you get possession, just to make sure everything's on the up and up. And you come in and, you know, they've changed light fixtures which you you fully remember not having that light fixture and it's not in the photos that were on the on the uh, realtor site that you came to see so you know that once they took that once you bought the house they took it which in that case they're not supposed to like curtains and all that kind of shit is supposed to stay uh and apparently they had a very large mirror like a very full length mirror that they had attached to their bedroom wall. It had sentimental value to them. Spoiler alert, I didn't want the mirror. So they took the mirror with them. All power to you. Was your mirror has sentimental value? I didn't want it. We're all winners. Except um, this person had put the mirror up and then painted. So when they took the mirror down, there was a big rectangle of other color in the middle of that wall. And I went, wait a minute, what's happening right now? And our realtor was like, oh, I'll find out. And then it was, well, it was a mirror. It was very sentimental. I'm like, I don't want the mirror. I want to know why is it like this? I moved in here to not do anything. I didn't move in here to, to have to come and paint and there's no paint. So I had to take a, I had to take a piece of paint from the wall that was let look nice and take it somewhere to get it matched so that I could only have to paint that spot because I didn't have time to paint the whole wall. It worked and it looks fine, but it was a real fight, a real fight for that. The person, they just kept coming back with, well, they want the mirror. I'm like, we don't. This isn't about the damn mirror. mirror. It's about how you left it. And I mean, I say, We wanted a house we had to do nothing to. We did get like the basement carpet completely replaced. 
right before we moved in. And then I came the week before we moved in. I came every night after I would like put the baby to sleep, leave the husband in charge of sleeping kids, drive across town. And I came here, opened windows and painted all three kids' bedrooms because I told them I wanted moving to be a positive experience. So they each got to pick their own room paint color, except for the baby, because he was a baby. He didn't care. Uh, And so I uh, came here every night and painted three rooms and a section of wall in the master (laughs) bedroom (laughs) because, you know, that's how it goes. Um, Also, the treasures that get left behind are sometimes not pleasant. Most of the time they're fine. Like I have a very distinct memory of moving into a house in Yorkton, Saskatchewan. And there's like a, a carpeted part in front of where a TV would go and you open it up and you store wood in there because there's a fireplace to the side. And we opened it up and it was full of Sears wish books, which was Like, I don't know why I would have given anything to get into this house and find it full of Sears wish books because what a dream. Yeah. What a dream. It's not like, that's when Christmas season starts, you know, like when you're a kid and you walk in the door and you get the, it came and you're like, okay, get my chocolate milk, get my highlighters. I'm ready to go. (laughs) That's where it started. Oh God. Yeah. I was just going to say. That's where it started. Yep. Yep. Well, well, she comes by it honestly. She does. Anyway, uh, stay tuned for more of uh, Laura Dash's DIYs. It's a uh, mystery to me if it's going to turn out at all. Um, what I've chosen to do in the meantime is I've ordered all new covers for all the cushions, a new hey. rug, uh, to add some some throw cushions. You know, jazz it up out there. That'll freshen sure. it up even if I don't succeed on, uh, you know, refinishing all the wood. And then I've gotten covers to put over the furniture in the the downtimes. Hey! So that's something, right? I've done something. I've done something. If I don't you've, succeed... You've learned, see, you've already learned. Yeah. And now that the coffee table is two different colors because of the two different products, I guess I could... I guess I could prime and paint that and then just refinish all the rest of it it's gonna be a bad move for me to do that i'm guessing i don't know if you have yeah any, I, I don't know if you have any experience painting eucalyptus <laughs> why is it made of i don't know I are you a know. koala bear i, I just... wish i wish well then i'd be eating it anyway again stay tuned dear listeners because this is gonna be you're talking about a romp this won't be one but you know oh. what a gift um Today's episode, we're talking about Kristen Modafferi. Modafferi. Uh, this is their our apron. Apron. Not a drop of liquor in me. You're doing April great. Patrons poll pick. Uh, for those who don't know, we're on Patreon. Patreon.com slash True Crime and Cocktails, where there are bonus episodes, live monthly Q&As. And if you are a patron every month, you can vote on an episode that we will cover on this feed of the show. And this was our April winner. So I will give you some backstory about the case and we're going to get into it. So in June 1997, 18-year-old Kristen Modafferi was living on her own for the first time. After finishing her freshman year of university, Kristen moved out to San Francisco to gain new experiences and take some summer classes. But the day before her classes were set to begin, Kristen went missing. And due to Kristen's oblivious roommates, police didn't start investigating the case until a week after Kristen's disappearance. So what happened to Kristen Modafferi? Did she just decide to abandon her life and start over somewhere else? Did she unknowingly respond to a personal ad placed by a psychopath? Or did she happen to cross paths with a famous killer? Christy Oxborough investigates. I uh, love how fast and loose I'm playing it with the word psychopath. I stand by it. Uh, but based, I have a specific person in mind, which is why I said it. Um, I do feel a little guilty that I called the roommates oblivious. Mm, I, I, but I, mean, I, I also I stand that, by that. I think you can. I think you can. And, and listen, we'll, we'll get into all of that. It sounds like if she wasn't reported missing for a week, or the police didn't start investigating for a week. That sounds 
Like maybe there's something there. Again, you know better than me, <laughs> but I, I don't, I'm just supporting you that I, I think it was more than fair. Again, now, this was also if, an unsolved mystery. This was on the original it, unsolved mystery. It was. I, and I didn't even know that. I went searching for like a specific documentary to see if there was one. Um, I don't necessarily need one, but I know that the people like uh, I, we tell them uh, the week before that this is something you could watch if you wanted to. And so I went searching to see if there was something and I found that. And uh, yeah, it, Robert Stack still going. He, he like he kept going until like the end. Like I was very impressed that he stayed with that show. And it's so funny that as a kid, I was like, oh, his voice is terrifying, but I love this. And as an adult, I'm like, no, it's just terrifying. Like, I'm so freaked out. Just terror. I hear his voice and I'm just terrorized. Oh, and I yeah, know that's I, I, probably a childhood trauma from watching that show way too young. Yep. Yep. But again, I thought it was basically a sitcom. I didn't know it was real. And that's when the trauma occurred is learning that it was real. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. Ah, uh, bless her heart. So a disclaimer for the episode, uh, it will contain mentions of physical abuse, sexual assault, animal abuse, and suicide. Trigger warning for those who need it. Kristen Deborah Modafferi was born June 1st, 1979 in Danbury, Connecticut. Her father, Robert, was an electrical engineer and her mother, Deborah, was an elementary school teacher. Kristen was the second of four daughters First was Allison, born in 1977, then Kristen in 79, followed by Lauren in approximately 1982, and Megan in 1990. In 1988, the family relocated to Charlotte, North Carolina for Robert's job. The Modafferis are a very close-knit family. Kristen had a great love of music and even joined an a cappella group with her sister Allison. Kristen was a brilliant student. She managed to skip a grade in elementary school and got straight A's throughout high school, scored 1570 on her SATs, all while working a part-time job at Wolfman Pizza. For reference, a perfect score on the SATs is 1600. Oh, wow. Zach Morris got 1502. <laughs> did you need to look that up or did you just know? I knew. Uh, I, I, I was going to go into it further and read all their scores, but I actually think I did in a very early episode. So I chose not to this time, but I'm like, no, I'm pretty sure Zach got 1502 and Jesse got 1250. She, yeah, I think you're right. But again, it's not the point. Oh, that show. Speaking of my childhood, yeah. not a trauma, but love that show. Uh, in 1996, Kristen graduated with honors from Providence High School and was awarded a Park Scholarship. The scholarship was established in 1996 to provide educational opportunities to exceptionally talented young people with outstanding accomplishments. The program provides students with a four-year scholarship to North Carolina State University, where Kristen studied industrial design. As part of the curriculum, the university suggested that students take a summer to travel and gain experience. Students were told to take elective classes at another university while they traveled so that they could put those credits towards their degrees. Kristen loved traveling with her family and thought this would be a great opportunity for her. And since she greatly enjoyed a family vacation to San Francisco a few years prior, Kristen decided that she would head to California. She was excited to live on her own for the first time. On June 1st, her 18th birthday, Kristen arrived in San Francisco. She signed up for a photography class at UC Berkeley, as well as a belly dancing lesson at the YMCA. Kristen planned to rent a place in San Francisco, but the rent was too expensive, so she ended up renting a room in a five-bedroom house on Jane Avenue in Oakland. To help pay for her rent, Kristen immediately started to hand out resumes, and the next day she secured two part-time jobs. On weekends, Kristen worked at a cafe located inside the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and during the week, 
she worked at Spinelli's Coffee Shop, which was located on the ground floor of the Crocker Galleria in the middle of San Francisco's financial district. Spinelli's is now actually Tully's Coffee. I don't know if that makes a difference, but anyone in the area, there you go. There you go. Uh, the manager of Spinelli's later said, quote, when Kristen came in, I was fully staffed, but she was just so darn likable that I told her I would fi somehow find hours for her. Kristen spent the next few weeks working during the day until 3 p.m., then exploring the city until 11 p.m. With classes starting on June 24th, Kristen wanted to squeeze in as much sightseeing as possible. So on June 23rd, 1997, Kristen took public transportation or Bay Area Rapid Transit, known as BART for short, uh, which dropped her off two blocks from the Galleria. She walked the rest of the way. This is how she got to her job at Spinelli's. During her shift from 7 a.m. until 3 p.m., Kristen asked her co-workers for ideas on things she could do on her last day of freedom. The co-workers were Kelly Strathman, Alan Beauregard, and John Burkhalter. Unfortunately, Kristen had already done the activities that her co-workers had suggested, so when her shift was done, Kristen had no definitive plans. She did mention she might head to Baker Beach, which is next to Land's End, it was a place she had been just like two, three days prior. Uh, it's a popular tourist spot, and Kristen had suggested uh, she might head there to take pictures, saying, quote, maybe I'll check it out again. A co-worker gave Kristen directions on how to get to the beach using the BART, or just BART. I don't know if it's the BART. Either way, uh, they claimed that Kristen might have headed to a party there, uh, but police were not able to confirm whether a party actually took place that night or not. Less than an hour later, some of Kristen's co-workers happened to be looking into the Galleria when they noticed Kristen on the second floor of the Galleria at 3.45 p.m. She was walking shoulder to shoulder with a blonde woman that the co-workers did not recognize. The only description of the woman was that she was blonde and carrying a green backpack. So was Kristen with the blonde woman, or were they simply walking near each other in a crowded mall? Either way, despite many pleas to the public, the blonde woman has never been identified and has never come forward. The Spinelli's manager is fairly certain that he saw Kristen exit the mall on her own. But whether Kristen was with the blonde or not, her co-workers found it odd that Kristen was still in the Galleria so long after her shift, as she would always leave the building as soon as her shift was done. Some sources claim that Kristen forgot to officially clock out at the end of her shift, which is also unusual behavior for her. Police have claimed that there is surveillance footage of Kristen withdrawing money from an ATM, that footage, along with the location of the ATM, have not been released to the public, but sadly, it was the last time that Kristen was seen. At the time, Kristen was wearing a black Spinelli's t-shirt, a long sleeve blue plaid flannel shirt, tan pants, and high top sneakers. She was also carrying a dark green Jansport backpack that contained two library books. As of May 2022, Kristen Modafferi has never been found. She was just 18 years old at the time of her disappearance. Kristen was described as dependable, creative, and hardworking. She had an infectious positivity and just radiated light. Kristen was vivacious, witty, and mature beyond her years. She loved to travel and often took day trips around San Francisco. When Kristen didn't arrive home on the evening of June 23rd, none of her roommates were concerned. According to them, Kristen had been gone overnight at least once before, so they just assumed she was staying with a friend. The following day, Kristen didn't show up to her first day of classes at UC Berkeley. While living in California, Kristen called her parents regularly. She had to told them she was having a great time and that she'd made some friends and had done a lot of sightseeing. Kristen's father, Robert, tried to call her on June 24th, but got no answer. But he assumed that she was busy with her first day of classes. He called again on June 25th and left a message with one of Kristen's roommates. 
When there was still no sign of Kristen on the morning of June 26th, Kristen's roommates got concerned. They spoke with some of her Spinelli's co-workers who said that Kristen had missed a shift. They realized that no one had heard from Kristen in more than 48 hours. So one of the roommates contacted Kristen's parents who called their local police to report her missing. Robert and Deborah Modafferi flew to San Francisco on Friday, June 27th, where they reported Kristen missing to the Oakland Police Department. And for some reason, the police didn't start investigating Kristen's disappearance until Monday, June 30th, a full week after uh, Kristen had last been seen. Huh. I also like that she report they report her missing on a Friday, and it was like, ah, we'll take the weekend and then get started on Monday. You know, like that was the kind yeah. of energy that it felt, which I understand that police are busy and I'm sure there's a lot of runaways kind of thing. So they just assume, give it some time, they'll come back. But time yeah. is of the essence in these, isn't it? Oh, God, yeah. So police took bloodhounds to the Crocker Galleria where the dogs tracked Kristen's scent to the bus stop just outside the mall. The dogs also tracked Kristen's scent at the end of the bus route at Sutro Heights Park, which is where Land's End is located. The dogs picked up Kristen's scent at Ocean Beach, which is a popular spot for tourists because of its panoramic view. From Ocean Beach, the bloodhounds were able to track Kristen's scent to a restaurant called the Cliff House, which has a viewing deck where tourists often watch sea lions. Her scent was then tra traced down a path through the saltwater public swimming complex called the Sutro Baths, but it was lost along the beach. Dozens of police officers and National Park Service rangers searched the beach areas, but there was no sign of Kristen or the dark green backpack that she was last seen carrying. Police spoke with people along the beach and no one in the area recalled seeing a girl matching Kristen's description. But my question, did the bloodhounds pick up Kristen's scent from the night she went missing? Or was it her scent from two days prior when she was there for the first time? When Kristen's room was searched, police found a Bay Guardian, Bay Guardian newspaper in Kristen's trash can. In it, a personal ad had been circled, which read, Friends, female seeking friends to share activities, who enjoy music, photography, working out, walks, coffee, or simply the beach, exploring the Bay Area. Interested? Call me. But the police didn't consider this a potential lead until months later, and by then, the Bay Guardian had upgraded to a new computer system and had purged their backlog. There was no way to tell who posted the ad, and the phone number was no longer in service. During the week of June 11th, when the ad ran in the paper, the Bay Guardian was doing a special promotion where ads could be taken out for free. So the author of the ad will never be found. At first, police wondered if Kristen had written the ad herself. But to me, if you place an ad in a newspaper, are you really going to circle your own ad? And if you do, then why turn around and throw it out? Well, and also, wouldn't they know that the phone number would be hers? Like, you why, would, would, why would she post it with a fake phone number? I don't know. That's the thing. I don't get how they were so quick to like, oh, well, it could have been her. I'm like, really? Why? That's That doesn't make any sense to me at all. Yeah, I don't get it. Uh, while a lot of activities listed in the ad were similar to Kristen's interests, I highly doubt she wrote the ad herself. Is it possible she considered responding to the ad? Of course, but we have no way of knowing whether or not she actually did. And if Kristen did respond, did that lead to her disappearance? And what about the blonde woman who Kristen was seen with at the Galleria on the day of her disappearance? Was that woman somehow connected to the ad? With no solid leads, everyone involved in the case knew they needed to keep Kristen's name and face in the public eye. Kristen's fellow park scholars at North Carolina State University hung yellow ribbons and missing posters around the campus and the entire city of Charlotte. In January 1998, the students came up with a plan to get Kristen's case talked about on live television. 
ESPN was filming a basketball game at the university, so they handed out yellow ribbons to everyone in the crowd. The players were prevented from wearing ribbons due to NCAA rules, but the coach, the head coach on both teams wore a ribbon. So many fans watching at home called ESPN to ask about the ribbons that the announcers actually ended up talking about Kristen's case on the live broadcast. So kudos to them for the plan and kudos for it working. Uh, with the Modafferi family in San Francisco, they handed out flyers uh, about Kristen all over the Bay Area. They traveled to San Francisco six times in the first year to walk the city and hand out flyers. The whole family went, including the youngest daughter, Megan, who was only seven years old at the time. Robert and Deborah Modafferi uh, did interviews with numerous news stations and even appeared on the Maury Povich show. Kristen's disappearance was also featured in season 11 of the original Unsolved Mysteries. An anonymous donor donated 20 billboards around the San Francisco area that the family used to post photos of Kristen and a plea to the public for any information. And it wasn't just people who knew Kristen who were trying to help. Dennis Mann, who lived in South Carolina, heard about Kristen's case on the news, but he later said he didn't think much of it because he assumed Kristen would be qu found quickly. When months went by with no news about Kristen, Dennis felt compelled to help in any way that he could, so he looked up the Modafferi family in the phone book and went to their house with an offer to help with the search. Robert and Deborah were skeptical at first, but eventually gave their blessing for Dennis to officially, assert, officially assist in the search. Dennis flew to San Francisco and spent weeks standing on street corners handing out flyers. He, was inter he interviewed dozens of people related to the case and has followed leads to Hawaii and Thailand. He wrote a blog about the case and created a podcast about it, which featured Dennis's investigations on the 1996 disappearance of Kristen Smart and the 2002 disappearance of Kent Jacobs, as well as Kristen Modafferi. Which, of course, this all then leads me to a brief other cases side note. Yes. You know, I can't just mention two names and leave it there. So very briefly, 19-year-old Kristen Denise Smart was found passed out on a lawn at 2 a.m. after a friend's birthday party on May 25th, 1996. Two students helped Kristen walk to her dorm room, and a third named Paul Flores joined them to help. Flores told the other students he'd make sure that Kristen got home safely, but she hasn't been seen since. An earring potentially belonging to Kristen Smart was found in the home of Paul Flores's mother, but it was not taken into evidence and has since been lost. According to police, Paul Flores allegedly sexually assaulted two intoxicated women in 2011 and 2017, and in January 2020, during a phone tap, uh, in a phone call between Paul and his mother, the mother said, quote, the other thing I need you to do is start listening to the podcast. I need you to listen to everything they say so we can punch holes in it, wherever we can punch holes. Maybe we can't. You're the one that can tell me. Oh, my God. Yeah. On April 13th, 2021, Paul Flores and his father, Ruben, were arrested on suspicion of being involved in Kristen Smart's disappearance. After a search of their homes, investigators believe that she may have been buried under the deck of Ruben's home, but that the body had been recently moved. There was a significant amount of soil disturbance, appearing as though someone had dug out a lot of it and then just put it back. Samples of the soil tested positive for human blood. Prosecutors claim that the dig location also contained a sample of fibers in various colors consistent with the clothing that Kristen Smart was last seen wearing. The trial for Paul and Ruben Flores has been set for May 31st, 2022. The idea of someone being like, listen to the podcast and then we can use our, we can base our defense around what they're saying is wild to me. I mean, yeah. I just, and, I just, and also, I mean, look, I know very, very quickly, I know we've talked about this on the show before, but I will just say again, because this is obviously something that's been in the news. There's, you know, no, we don't need to get into the, I don't, I'm not going to derail us, but um, 
the idea again, and I'm not a mother of humans, yeah. but I, honestly, and I understand that I don't know because the, the love that you have for your child and whatever, but I really feel like if my child, if I knew my child had done that to someone, I feel like I'd be like, are you calling or am I? Like, I, I just don't think it's a, you gotta take it. You gotta take the heat, man. Like, I don't think that I could forgive myself knowing the other person's right? got, a, got like lost their child. Like, I, I don't know. Like, and again, I know it's very easy for me to say, cause I don't have a child, but I know we've touched on this before. And I just think it's very interesting. Um, well, we touched on it last week. I mean, Bonnie and Clyde, Clyde's mother was like, I will literally do anything to, uh, you know, protect my child or whatever. Yeah. Um, but this just feels, I don't know why I think, cause that was a different time. This where it's like, listen to the podcast. Let's make it, let's get our story straight. Just feels so dark to me. Yes. I don't know. And then what's it say about me that I was like, what podcast? Yeah. <laughs> we haven't covered it. Obviously it's not it's ours, not Christy. It's not us. That's okay. Oh, That's okay. But how disturbing. Just to be like, okay, let's hear what their theories are and let's prove, let's try and figure out a way that it proves they're wrong. I don't love it. I no, don't love that as a concept at all. No, it's terrifying. I've given way too many reasons of why people can do the things they do. I don't need them to use that in court. It's gross. I don't, I don't care for it. Yep. Yep. Uh, the second case that I mentioned uh, involves 41-year-old Kent Jacobs, who went missing in Hope Mills, North Carolina, on Sunday, March 10th, 2002. Kent, who had special needs, lived and worked in a group home during the week, but spent weekends living with his mother. Before church, Kent went for a walk near McDonald Road and Interstate 95, just two blocks from his mother's home, something he did often. Approximately 5 p.m., Kent was allegedly seen entering a small car next to the U.S. uh, 301. He did not return home for his 6 p.m. curfew and hasn't been seen since. As of May 2022, Kent has never been found, and there have been no arrests made in connection with his case. When Dennis Mann was asked his reason for continuing to volunteer with the Kristen Modafferi case for over 20 years, Dennis said, quote, Once you sit across the table from a mother of a missing child, I'm telling you, it changes you. The Modafferi family offered a reward for information about Kristen's disappearance. The reward, which started at $10,000, eventually increased to $50,000. And while it generated a lot of tips, none were ever developed into solid leads. By May 1998, the police were convinced that Kristen had been a victim of foul play, but they lacked any leads to take the investigation any further. So with that in mind, I want to focus on potential theories as to what may have happened to Kristen Modafferi. There are five theories that I'm going to focus on, the first being the one that police considered immediately. As there were no signs of foul play, police wondered if Kristen disappeared voluntarily. And I know there are a lot of people, teenagers especially, who run away from home for various reasons. But Kristen was already living on her own, away from home. So this theory doesn't make sense to me. Not to mention the fact that Kristen paid $925 for tuition at UC Berkeley, with class meant to start the day after she disappeared. Why pay that kind of money if you're not going to at least attempt to go? Kristen also didn't pick up a $400 paycheck from Spinelli's. And if you're going to run, you need money. So why wouldn't she have at least picked up the paycheck? So I'm quick to say that this theory seems unlikely in this particular case. But this kind of theory is something that has happened before, which brings us to the case of Lucy Ann Johnson. Lucy Ann Carvel, Carvel uh, was born October 14, 1935 in Skagway, Alaska. She married Marvin Johnson in 1954, and the couple had two children, Linda and Daniel. Lucy was last seen by a neighbor in Surrey, British Columbia in September 1961, but wasn't officially reported missing by her husband until May 1965. When Marvin admitted that Lucy had gone missing nearly four years before he reported it, 
police suspected foul play, and Marvin was suspected of Lucy's murder. Neighbors were questioned, Marvin was interrogated, and the Johnson family's yard was excavated. But no evidence was ever found, so Marvin was never charged. Marvin eventually remarried and died from natural causes in 1990. Cut to June 2013, nearly 52 years since Lucy's disappearance. The RCMP decide to highlight Lucy's case in their Missing of the Month series. This inspired Lucy's daughter, Linda, to do investigating on her own. And she learned her mother had briefly lived in the Yukon before moving to Surrey and marrying Marvin. So in July 2013, Linda placed an ad in a newspaper called Yukon News, asking for people with any knowledge of Lucy to reach out. Linda got a reply from a woman in White Horse, Yukon, who claimed that Lucy was her mother. It turns out that Marvin had been physically abusive for years, and Lucy hit her breaking point. She tried to take the children with her, but Marvin wouldn't allow it, so Lucy left on her own. She eventually remarried and had four more children. And the most shocking part for Linda was that Lucy was still alive. Linda and her mother were reunited more than 52 years after Lucy went missing. Wow. And one more, because this one was wild. And once I found out, I was like, oh, I've got to tell the people. It's what I do. Lawrence Joseph Bader was born December 2nd, 1926 in Akron, Ohio. Lawrence was a cookware salesman for the Reynolds Metals Corporation and was married to a woman named Mary Lou with whom he had three children with one more on the way. On March 15th, 1957, Lawrence rented a 14 foot boat for a fishing trip on Lake Erie. A storm moved through the area and the boat was found abandoned the following day. The Coast Guard searched and said the lake got so rough during the storm that no man could have survived overboard. Four days later, a well-dressed man named John Johnson, better known as Fritz, showed up in Omaha, Nebraska at Round Table Bar. Soon after he arrived, for some reason, Fritz sat on a flagpole for 30 days to raise money for polio research. Okay. I have no idea how that even came about, but it made the locals very fond of Fritz, which led to him becoming a bartender, which led to him becoming a radio announcer and then a TV sports director at KETV7. He told vivid stories about growing up in, Bo in a Boston orphanage and his 13 years spent in the U.S. Navy. Fritz also had a very colorful personality. He drove a hearse that he named his hunting vehicle as it had pillows, an incense burner, and a bar in the back. Okay. Fritz married a 20-year-old single mother in 1961 and adopted her daughter. Soon after, the couple welcomed a son. In 1964, Fritz lost his left eye to a cancerous tumor and had to start wearing an eye patch. On February 2nd, 1965, Fritz was demonstrating archery equipment at a sporting goods show in Chicago when a man approached him and said, you look familiar. Despite the eye patch and the fact that Fritz had a mustache, the man was adamant that Fritz was really Lawrence Bader. One of Lawrence's nieces happened to be at the show. She also believed that Fritz was really Lawrence. Fritz laughed the experience off, claiming not to have a clue what they were talking about. The niece contacted two of Lawrence's brothers, who had Fritz's fingerprints compared with Lawrence's military records, and sure enough, they matched. Fritz was, in fact, Lawrence Bader, who had gone missing seven years earlier. And while you would think that Lawrence being found Alive would be nothing but a positive thing. It actually caused a lot of problems for his wives. Uh, his first wife, Mary Lou, had been receiving monthly social security payments, as well as nearly $40,000 from her husband's life insurance. Now that he was alive, she would have to pay that back. Oh. Uh, then there's the fact that Mary Lou uh, had started a new relationship and had recently become engaged. 
But with the reappearance of Lawrence, that means their marriage was reinstated. And since Mary Lou was Catholic, she felt that divorce wasn't an option. And since their marriage made his second marriage null and void, Fritz's second wife didn't know what she was going to do. At the time of his disappearance, Lawrence was $20,000 in debt and he was in trouble with the IRS for tax evasion. So police wondered if Lawrence purposely ran to avoid his money problems. But a team of psychiatrists studied Fritz for 10 days and concluded he genuinely had no memory of his former life. He allegedly suffered from amnesia in the boating accident, and the doctors said the person that a person suffering from amnesia for several year, years while filling filling in the missing time with false memories is rare, but it's not unheard of. And while it makes sense that someone with severe money trouble might try and run from their problems, I find it unlikely that that person would go and get a job where he's basically a local celebrity and like out in the public all the time. Yeah. If you're, if you're running from one life to another, would you really keep yourself in the public eye? Or well, maybe it's the situation of hiding in plain sight. Or you're a crazy narcissist. <laughs> that, is an, that is a great point. Uh, some have even debated as to whether the tumor may have played a role in Lawrence's memory loss. His cancer returned this time in his liver. And Lawrence, also known as Fritz, died on September 16th, 1966, at the age of 39. So not a lot of answers that came from that, I yeah. guess, but I just find that wild. Again, I don't believe that either of these scenarios is what happened to Kristen Modafferi. I offer them as examples to show cases where this particular theory is valid. Yeah. It's what I do. So theory number two is that Kristen may have suffered a terrible accident. Since the bloodhounds tracked Kristen sent down a path that leads to a cliff, Police believe that Kristen may have fallen from the cliff and drowned. According to locals, the main path that leads to Land's End Point is very narrow with a sheer drop down and no fencing. So is it possible that Kristen lost her footing and fell? Yes, the area has had multiple accidents within the last few years. Uh, around 12.10 p.m. on October 30th, 2014, 26-year-old Randy Salmon a recent transplant from Seattle, was hiking with a 27-year-old male uh, when they both fell from a cliff. The man had minor injuries, but otherwise was fine. Randy was pronounced dead at the scene. On June 22, 2017, 17-year-old Victoria LaRocca slipped off the cliff's edge and fell 150 to 200 feet. On October 5, 2019, a 24-year-old uh, Anahi Alejandra Riviero fell from a cliff and was swept out by strong currents. Her body was found the following day. And on December 4th, 2019, 42 year old Jeffrey Rash died after falling 200 feet off the cliff. These stories are horrifying, but serve the purpose of showing that these kinds of accidents do, in fact, happen. So, is it possible that Kristen fell? Yes. Just as in the grand scheme of all things being possible, it's also possible that Kristen purposely jumped. Yep. I don't believe she took her own life. She was loving her time in California and seemed to be really looking forward to starting classes. Of course, we can't accurately suggest what was going on for Kristen, as you can never tell what someone is truly going through mentally. But with that being said, I don't think suicide was a likely option. And whether she fell or jumped, the area is very popular with both locals and tourists, so I like to believe that there would have been a potential witness as the area is often quite crowded. Of course, in the grand scheme of anything being possible, it is possible no one was around at the time of the accident. The Coast Guard was brought in to search the area, but they never found anything. Uh, theory number three is that maybe Kristen's roommates were involved. As stated earlier, due to the expensive rent in San Francisco, Kristen rented a room from a house at 274 Jane Avenue in the Adams Point area of Oakland. 
In the evenings when Kristen was done sightseeing, she would take the BART home and would still need to walk a mile or 1.6 kilometers from the station to the house. Is it possible that Kristen was grabbed on her way home? The house was in foreclosure at the time and the tenants were given five months to vacate. Kristen allegedly knew this information when she rented the room, but was fine with it because she was only staying for three months. The roommates included Griffin Cherry, Justin Neisler, and brothers Hans Opsal and Kurt Opsal. Now, it's difficult to find much information about the roommates, but from what I can tell, Justin was renting a room for the summer. He had no prior relationship to any of the other roommates. He was about 21 years old at the time. Hans was about 28 and Kurt was about 25. Griffin was 24 years old and considered to be the main roommate. I guess you could call him that as he collected the rent every month, um, although he didn't own the property. Three days before her disappearance, Kristen took $500 from her bank account and gave the cash to Griffin for July's rent. But Griffin told her instead of cash, he actually needed a money order. I don't understand why. Uh, Griffin later told Robert Modafferi that Kristen told him she was going to redeposit the $500 cash and get a money order on Monday. The money never got back into her account. Griffin was dating a girl named Sarah Levine, who went by the name Rosie, but they broke up as Rosie wanted to spend the summer in France, so her room at the house became available and Kristen moved in. When Rosie returned from France, she got back together with Griffin and the couple have since gotten married. I couldn't confirm it, but it sounds like they are still married to this day. As I mentioned earlier, when Kristen didn't come home on the night of June 23rd, none of the roommates seemed concerned. There were previous nights when Kristen didn't come home, so they thought perhaps she had a boyfriend who she was staying with. After a couple of days, they considered calling Kristen's parents, but they didn't want to rat her out, especially to her parents if she was secretly going off to see a guy. In the days after Kristen went missing, her roommates opened a letter that came to the house addressed to Kristen. They later claimed they hoped that it would contain a clue as to Kristen's whereabouts. And while I don't have the official confirmation as to the contents of the letter, a private investigator who saw it claims it was from the library as Kristen had signed up for a library card shortly after arriving in the area. So... Waiting days before contacting the family and opening Kristen's mail are both questionable moves. But with that being said, their explanations for those moves are relatively reasonable. So if it was one or multiple of the roommates, what was their motive? Did one of the roommates murder Kristen for the $500 cash that she had? Or maybe one of them hit on her and Kristen turned them down. Or maybe one of them gave her alcohol and she had too much and passed out. Maybe it was a simple accident and they panicked. Uh, All I know is all of the roommates did fully cooperate with police and none of them appear to have a record. Oh boy. I have many thoughts that I will save until the end, but many thoughts. Um, Wow. This is a complex one. This is a confounding one, but I know that we've still got a couple of theories to go. So before we get to the rest of them, let's take a quick break, grab another drink, hit the can, and we're going to be right back with more about Kristen Modafferi on this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. Here we go. Second clap on three. One, two, three. Welcome back to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're, of course, talking the Kristen Modafferi case. Uh, Before the break, Christy ran through three of the five theories we're talking about. So now we're heading on to theory four. What you got for us? Oh, well, theory four is that maybe one of Kristen's neighbors were involved. Okay. She lived at 274. Jane Avenue. The house at 278 Jane Avenue was a halfway house for probation violators 
from Oakland, Alameda, San Francisco, and Contra Costa areas. The Mataferis said, had they known this prior to Kristen going there, they wouldn't have allowed her to rent that particular room. According to Dennis Mann, uh, the Oakland Police Department also weren't aware the address was being used as a halfway house. A member of the Adams Point Neighborhood Homeowners Association sent out a letter to houses in the neighborhood. It was titled, A Plea from the Jane Avenue Neighbors. I'm not going to read the entire thing, but this is a section from that letter. Again, I would like it to be said, I'm reading exactly what was in the letter. Some of these wordings are not how I would word things, but it is what it is. Okay. Uh, quote, as most of you know, 278 Jane Avenue has been a nuisance for years. It was a convalescent hospital from the 60s until the state closed it down for licensing violations in 1985. Since then, 278 Jane has been home to a pit bull breeding and fighting ring, raising and slaughtering rabbits, a methamphetamine laboratory, several roach coaches closed by the health department for poisoning Laney college students and also for selling drugs. 278 Jane opened again recently under cover of deception, lies and deceit instead of a facility for nine to 14 year old youths, as we were told it would be, it is a halfway house for juvenile probationers. So is it possible that someone dangerous was living next door and they noticed Kristen on her way home? She had a routine. She would come home at the same time every day. So it's possible someone in the neighborhood took advantage of that. But of course, there isn't a public list of everyone who stayed in that house. So I can't give any specific su suspects from 278 Jane Avenue. It is also completely possible uh, the person from the homeowners association overreacted as to who was living there. Maybe the house was a little run down. So they were like, well, obviously there's a pit bull fighting ring in there. Who knows? I don't know if they knew that specifically or not. I'm also realizing I cut out uh, the section from that letter that used some very choice words that I don't use, which is reading it, reading it out loud. I was like, oh, I guess I cut that stuff out. Oh, well. Yeah, well, doesn't matter. The, the point is, I don't know if they were overreacting or if this was a potential threat. So that is why it is out there in my theories. Right. Now, this one, this, this particular theory, and I know people are going to be like, why are we at the final theory already? It's too early. We got time. <laughs> this is gonna this one's gonna take a bit and it goes on multiple tangents so great just buckle up and try and stay with uh theory number five is that Kristen might have been abducted by someone whether she was outright grabbed off the street or possibly lured to a vehicle or a location Kristen was described by her family as very trusting According to some of her co-workers, Kristen would often accept rides from strangers when exploring the city. Oh, boy. Then there was an incident one night after a concert. Kristen missed the last train to Oakland, so she decided to spend the night on a bench at the train station. A man that Kristen met at the concert saw her, told her that's incredibly dangerous, and offered to let her sleep on the couch at, her, at his brother's house. Kristen accepted. No. After Kristen's disappearance, police were able to track that man down. He was eliminated as a suspect. But that what also his brother. That also explains why uh, the roommates were like, "Well, there were nights where she didn't come home," and it's like, "Well, there's one right there." Yeah. So it's just, I am in no way blaming in any of way course. for that. She was eighteen. At 18, you don't think horrible things like we think now about strangers yeah. and all of that. She's She was a kind person. You always hope everybody else is going to be kind. 
you do stuff when you're young that you wouldn't do. Of course. Now. So of course I'm, I'm, I'm always shocked that I'm still alive. Don't oh, get me yeah. wrong. I, I have no judgment. It's more just that I'm cringing yes. because I want to be protective. That's all. Of course. I'm just say, saying for uh, the people, I'm not shaming the choice. I'm just bringing the choice up as a, if that was possible, could she have gotten into a car with the wrong person kind of a situation? hundred percent. I think it's important um, to bring up if we know she had yes. a pattern of getting into strangers, people's strange people's cars, which you're, I think that's, yeah, you have to bring that up. Absolutely. Oh yeah. And also again, not shaming, yeah. just saying she was a kid. Oh God. Yeah. She'd never lived on her own before. So the world was her oyster. She was going to do anything. I get it. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. If I moved out when I was 18, oh boy. <laughs> I can't even, I did move out when I was 18, but yeah. I was terrified of everything. So I was, oh, I was there the it other is. way. I was the other way. Yeah. I, I mean, I guess I moved out at, I was 19 when I moved yeah. out and yeah, that was, it was like, Oh God, well, I guess we can drink at noon. Like, you know, like it was, it was, it was not it's great. Your, it's like your college years. That's all. It's just, okay. yes, there we go. There we go. So the question remains, if Kristen was abducted, who was involved? What about the blonde woman seen with Kristen at the Galleria? Was she used by someone to lure Kristen into a trap? Or maybe the blonde woman isn't involved in any way. I just think if she wasn't involved, that she would have come forward by now. Maybe it's possible that Kristen and the blonde woman were both abducted. But again, by who? Yeah. Well, there is the possibility uh, that the assailant is currently unknown to the police, possibly someone who hasn't been on their radar yet, or someone who is later arrested for another unconnected crime. But since a list of unknown suspects would be incredibly long, and not to mention incredibly difficult to create, uh, as it could be anyone that was in the San Francisco area at the time, we're going to focus on specific individuals who may have been involved. First on that list is Robert Durst, who I'm sure our dear listeners know from the true crime documentary, The Jinx. And for those of you familiar with this case, you know I could go on about that sleaze bag for hours. So for the sake of today's episode, I'm going to attempt to give the Cliff Notes version of Durst's alleged crimes. So Robert Durst was from a prominent real estate family in Manhattan. In the fall of 1971, 28-year-old Durst meets 19-year-old Kathleen McCormick. After two dates, Durst invites Kathleen to move to Vermont, where he owns a health food store. In 1973, Durst's father demands that he rejoin the family business and move back to New York. So Durst and Kathleen move to New York and get married. According to Vulture, by 1980, Kathleen is openly disappointed in her marriage and admits to friends and family that Durst is becoming abusive and controlling and that he forced her to have an abortion. Kathleen considers a divorce, but instead starts an affair. Around the same time, Durst starts an affair with Prudence Farrow, who was apparently the inspiration behind the Beatles song, Dear Prudence. No shit. On January 6, 1982, Kathleen visits a hospital after a particularly brutal assault from Durst. Weeks later, on January 31st, Kathleen attends a party at her friend's house in Connecticut, but leaves after getting an angry phone call from her husband. Before she leaves, Kathleen tells her friend, quote, if something happens to me, check it out. I'm afraid of what Bobby will do. Kathleen then walked out the door and as of May 2022 has never been found. She was officially declared dead by a Manhattan court in 2017, and she was just 29 at the time of her disappearance. Durst claimed that Kathleen returned to their cottage in South Salem, New York on January 31st when they got into a big fight. He said Kathleen wanted to return to Manhattan, so he dropped her off at the Metro North station. Durst claims that he spoke to Kathleen on the phone when she arrived at her apartment. 
A doorman claims he saw Kathleen enter the building that night, and a colleague claims that a woman claiming to be Kathleen called in sick to work the next morning. Durst reported Kathleen missing on February 5th. A few months go by and Kathleen's friends go to check her house. They find Kathleen's mail, which is unopened, all thrown in the trash. The doorman then admits he only saw Kathleen from behind and it was from a distance, so it might not have been her. Uh, but since there was no evidence of a crime, Kathleen was listed as missing. Tired of the large amount of press that his wife's disappearance was bringing him, Durst appoints his friend, New York Magazine journalist Susan Berman, to be his unofficial spokesperson. In 1990, Durst secretly files for divorce from Kathleen, citing abandonment, and sells their South Salem cottage. In 1994, Durst gets passed over as head of the family of the company, and the position goes to his younger brother. According to Vulture, Durst had a nasty habit of peeing in his uncle's trash can, which caused the family to overlook Durst when it came to finding a new head of the company. So Durst gets mad and kind of breaks away from his family and spends the next six years traveling the country. In 1999, police receive a tip about the location of Kathleen's body, which causes investigators to reopen Kathleen's case, but this time as a homicide. The Durst's old cottage was searched, as was a nearby lake, but nothing was found. In August 2000, Susan Berman writes to Durst looking for a loan. He responds by sending her two checks, each worth sorry, $25,000. While investigating Kathleen's case, the police reach out to Susan. On December 11th, 2000, Durst marries his girlfriend of 12 years, Deborah Lee Sheridan, in a 15-minute ceremony. The rabbi later said that Durst, quote, didn't smile once. On December 19th, Durst flew from New York to San Francisco, then back to New York on December 23rd. On December 24th, Susan Berman is found dead after being shot in the back of the head in her Los Angeles home. Nothing was stolen and there were no signs of forced entry. An anonymous letter was addressed to the Beverly Hills police, uh, claimed that there was a cadaver at Susan's house and they should look into it. The author of the letter misspelled Beverly by adding an extra E in there. That will come up again. Uh, once again, looking to get out of the limelight, Durst moved to Galveston, Texas in April 2001, where he posed as a mute woman named Dorothy. He stayed at a boarding house where his neighbor was an elderly man named Morris Black. On September 30th, a family in Galveston found a dismembered torso while they were out fishing. Police found several body parts, as well as the packaging for a saw and a newspaper with the boarding house address on it. When police uh, searched the boarding house, they found a receipt with Durst's name on it. On October 3rd, police brought a search warrant to the boarding house where they found blood in Morris's room and a trail of blood that led to Durst's room. They also found a pair of bloody boots and a bloody knife in his room. Durst was arrested October 9th. Police found the saw and a gun in Durst's car. Thanks to his wife, Durst posted the $300,000 bail and disappeared. Nine days later, Durst rents a car in Mobile, and Mobile Alabama under the name Morris Black. Ugh. He is finally arrested November 30th in Pennsylvania and found to have two guns, $37,000 cash and Morris Black's driver's license. In September 2003, Durst goes on trial for the murder of Morris Black. Durst claims Morris threatened him with a gun, so Durst killed him in self-defense. Durst then fully admits that he dismembered Morris. And somehow, even after that insane admission, Durst was found not guilty. He played, later pleaded guilty to tampering with evidence and jumping bail, which earned him a five-year sentence. Durst was paroled in December 2005 and told to remain near his home. So Durst immediately goes back to the boarding house where he killed Morris, allegedly. 
Durst also decides to stop at a mall while he's out. And while there, he's spotted by the judge who presided over his case and is taken to jail for violating his parole. He was released in March 2006. In 2010, a docudrama about his life called All Good Things was released. Despite a warning from his lawyer, Durst reaches out to the documentary's director and offers to do an on-camera interview, which would later become The Jinx. It should have been called The Boob. (laughs) During the interview, Durst denies any involvement in the deaths of Kathleen and Susan. At some point, the director discovers an envelope addressed to Susan from Durst, which matches the handwriting of the Beverly Hills letter that the police received, notifying them of Susan's murder. It also had the same misspelling of the word Beverly. In 2012, the Jinx director interviewed Durst again, confronting him about the newly discovered envelope. Durst was unable to tell which of the two handwriting samples were his own. Afterwards, Durst is in the bathroom, not realizing his mic was still hot, He starts muttering to himself and says, quote, there it is. You're caught. What the hell did I do? Killed them all, of course. It should be noted the audio was edited for the documentary, so his wording was slightly different in the real recording, which was, quote, I don't know what's in the house. Oh, I want this. Killed them all, of course. I want to do something new. There's nothing new about that. What a disaster. He was right. I was wrong. And the burping. I'm having difficulty with the questions. What the hell did I do? So I find that interesting, but that's also a man having, that's a man split mentally having two converse, like having a conversation with himself fully. Yeah. But also I will admit, I may be a terrible person, but I will admit hearing him say, oh, and the burping, it, it, it full cracked me up. He's a murderer. (laughs) But I want you to know, I've watched the jinx probably three times all the way through. I've watched every episode. I, when it first came like years ago. Yeah, I get it. It's, he is fascinating to me. Psychologists have fascinating to me. Yeah. The burping that moment. Yeah. I mean, it's like, this guy's a kook. He chose to live as a mute woman. There's so many layers to this, but anyway, we'll we'll get to it later. Yeah. I mean, again, he was right. I was wrong. And the burping. It was just the way he said the burping. <laughs> Again, know. look, you got to find joy where you find joy. And you do. And that, that guy is a dink it, and a half. Oh, this this person is ridiculous. Um, and yeah, I get that. Now's not the time for laughter. But the way he said the burping. It is also miraculous that he did when he when they when they were on to him. I haven't seen it in years, but if I remember correctly. He did have that physical response, like his his lying tell was burping, which is fascinating. I that mean, it was so guttural, like that's such a again a psychologist hat. That's amazing because there's so many tells when people lie. They, sure. they they look to the exit or they look to they look to the ground. Like there's a bunch of different little tells, but like your body physically burping. I I don't feel like I've ever heard of that one other than him, which is again no. Oh, he's. He's something else. I can't. Anyway, yes, I can't, I'm so but, sorry. I've, I've derailed. No, again, I'm the one who keeps saying burping because I was hearing him say it that made me laugh. And again, find your joy where you find joy. Oh, yeah. And if that means you buy yourself a Funko Pop from the new Ghostbusters movie simply because it's Paul Rudd with a beard and you feel you should own a Paul Rudd Funko Pop, you do it. Yep. I'm just not saying that about anyone in particular. I'm saying that about anybody out there listening that would like a Paul Rudd Funko Pop. Do it. Of course. Of course. Mm -mm. Uh, Despite how the sound recorded, the director didn't realize what he had until June 2014. In early 2014, the LAPD reopened their investigation into the murder of Susan Berman. July 24th, 2014, Durst turns himself in after an incident at a CVS in Houston where Durst peed on a candy rack. Yeah, he was fined $500. Months later, police conclude that Durst is the author of the cadaver letter that was sent to them after the death of Susan Berman. In March 2015, Durst goes back on the run, only to be arrested four days later in New Orleans. 
He was found with $40,000 cash, a gun, and a latex mask that is levels of horrifying. Just so you know, I am going to post a picture of it on our socials because I found a picture of somebody holding it up and it's horrifying on Instagram and Facebook at True Crime and Cocktails and at Twitter, on Twitter, at Not Detectives. Almost got through it. Yeah. Oh my God, the math. I can't stop thinking about it. So uh, Durst pleads guilty to a gun charge and is sentenced to 85 months, but he's extradited to California to stand trial for Susan's murder. Durst pleads not guilty in November 2016, but he does admit to writing the letter that tipped off police about her murder. (laughs) After many delays, including health reasons, Hurricane Harvey, and the pandemic, Durst's trial finally starts in March 2020. In September 2021, Durst is convicted of Susan's murder, and he's sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. In October, he is officially charged with the murder of his first wife, Kathleen. Prosecutors believe that Durst killed Kathleen because she was trying to divorce him and then killed Susan because she knew too much. But before the trial could happen, Robert Durst died of cardiac arrest in prison on January 10th, 2022, at the age of 78. So this guy is clearly a piece of shit. Why am I bothering to bring him up? Well, there's the fact that in March 2015, police in Vermont started to look into whether there might be a connection between Durst and a missing college student. Interesting. 18-year-old freshman Lynn Scholes was last seen December 10th, 1971, eating dried prunes that she had bought at a health food store owned by Durst. As of May 2022, Lynn has never been found. Lynn was incredibly bright, and like Kristen Modafferi, Lynn had earned a National Merit Scholarship. Again, what does Lynn's case have to do with Kristen? Well, I only offer it to show that another smart, beautiful 18-year-old girl went missing in an area where Durst was living at the time. If it's possible he had something to do with Lynn's disappearance, then it's also possible he could be responsible for more disappearances. In 2003, the San Francisco District Attorney's Office released a report in which they attempted to connect Durst to the disappearance of two girls in Northern California in 1997. The girls in question are 16-year-old Karen Mitchell and 18-year-old Kristen Modafferi. Karen Mitchell went missing November 25th, 1997, almost exactly five months after Kristen disappeared. Karen was in Eureka, California, which is 271 miles or 436 kilometers north of San Francisco. At the time of Karen's disappearance, Durst was living in Trinidad, California, which is only about 23 miles or 37 kilometers north of Eureka. Karen used to volunteer at a shelter for people without housing, where Durst stayed multiple times. After leaving the shelter, Karen visited her aunt's shoe store, which Durst allegedly frequented, often dressed as a woman. Which doesn't come as a surprise as he would later go and live in Galveston posing as a woman. After Karen left her aunt's store, a witness saw Karen get into a vehicle. A sketch of the driver was released to the public, and many believe it bears a resemblance to Durst. As of May 2022, Karen Mitchell has not been found. Is Durst responsible for Karen's disappearance? He was in the area and potentially met Karen at the shelter, so I think it's more than possible. And since Durst owned a house in the San Francisco area at the time of Kristen's disappearance, some believe Durst may have been involved. Honestly, the idea that this creep was in the same area as Lynn, Karen, and Kristen when they all disappeared makes me seriously consider him as a suspect. Police were never able to find a connection between Durst and Kristen or any concrete evidence linking him to Karen, so Durst was never officially charged of either crime. From one sleazebag to another. Yeah. The next possible suspect 
in the disappearance of Kristen Modafferi involves an anonymous tip. On July 10th, ABC affiliate KGO TV in San Francisco received an anonymous phone call from a man who claimed that Kristen had been part of a lesbian love triangle. The caller, who named two specific women, said the women shot and killed Kristen in the backseat of a car near Market Street and Castro. The women then drove over the Golden Gate Bridge up to Point Reyes, where they hid the body underneath a wooden bridge. The reporter who took the call then contacted the police with the tip, and officers immediately headed over to the YMCA where these two women worked. And then I want to know, I heard Kristen signed up for belly dancing classes at a YMCA. Was it the same YMCA or a different one? Um, Had she been to a class yet? Had she been to that specific YMCA? Is it possible these two women could have seen her there? Well, I didn't get any of the answers I was looking for, but officers were very quick to believe that neither of these women were involved in Kristen's disappearance. The women were then separated and both asked who held a grudge against them to do something like this, and both, without hesitation, answered John, Anu- John Onuma. It turns out that 38-year-old John, who also went by the names Jade Ziku and Jade Yoshino, had a bit of a grudge against the women and had even threatened them publicly. John's girlfriend at the time, Jill Lampo, worked with these women, and John believed they were harassing Jill and plotting to get her fired. When police first met John, he denied ever making the phone call, which somehow turned into him bragging that Yeah, he made the phone call. John said the women were Jill's bosses and they had been harassing her. So when he learned about Kristen's disappearance on the news, he decided he'd try and use the case to get the women in trouble. That's disgusting. A hundred percent. John, of course, claimed he'd never met Kristen and that his anonymous phone call was simply a prank. He later said, quote, I put the attention on me when I shouldn't have and I screwed up. But the more police looked into John Anuma, the more gross things they learned about him. Like the fact that multiple women in the Bay Area have come forward to tell police about their negative experiences with John and how many of them responded to classified ads that he used to lure women to either steal their money or coerce them into having sex with him. In the spring of 1998, three women approached the police separately with stories about John and Numa. They said John held them against their will and tortured them. The torture included physical assault, sexual assault, being burned, and sleep deprivation. The women were all so afraid of him that they hadn't previously gone to the police. John was a shorter man, approximately five foot three, So he had been described as what we would call a Napoleon complex with rage issues. It's like when you see a bear in the woods and you're supposed to make yourself appear more intimidating. But in John's case, he sees everyone as a bear and his anger helps him feel taller. Safety tip, side note. I know that some of our true crew listen to our episodes while they go out on walks. So in case any of them should be near any woods and encounter a bear, I need this to be said. According to bearwise.org, if you meet a black bear in the woods, stand still and try to back away slowly. Do not run. If the bear follows you, stand your ground and try to appear larger than you are. Wave your arms, make a lot of noise. When the bear stops approaching you, slowly back away again. I just, I know we get a lot of comments that they listen to us on walks and I just, I need them to, I need them to be bear safety. Bear safety? I don't know. Bear safe, yeah. There we go. Uh, Investigators got a search warrant for Jill Lampo's apartment where John was living at the time. uh, And they found, quote, sizable traces of blood. It turned out to be animal blood, and the police claim it came from the cats owned by John's former girlfriend, 
One girlfriend claimed after a heated argument, John threatened to kill her. She said, quote, he hit me over the head and said, you know, I'm going to have to kill you. I can't let you go. Then he turned around and said, now you know what happened to Kristen. John says that that particular woman was just mad at him for breaking up with her. So she was just trying to get him into trouble. Yeah, because you're so appealing, John. Mm. Uh, Also found at the apartment was Jill Lampo's diary, which had pages ripped out from the days that Kristen went missing. Why were those pages missing? Jill said John ripped them out as they could be, quote, incriminating. Whoa. Jill has, Jill has never publicly stated what may have been on those missing pages. So with all the heat from police, John ends up leaving California and police struggle to find him. So John is featured on an episode of America's Most Wanted in 1999. John is found living in his native Hawaii in a million dollar home. But John didn't have a job. So how could he afford it? I mean, he didn't have a job in San Francisco either. And he was choosing to just live off Jill Lampo which is gross. But how was he able to live in such a lavish home in Hawaii? Well, it turns out the house was owned by a man named George Patrick Doobie, who went by Daniel for some reason, which leads me to a lengthy off the rails. Whoa, who the fuck is this guy? Side note. I can't wait. So to put it mildly, Daniel Doobie is a strange character. He had numerous children with different women. And before you think I'm being a prude, da- Doobie has between 15 and 21 children. Okay. So yeah, it's a lot. Uh, in 1978, he kidnapped one of his own children and fled to Thailand. Two years later, he called and told the child's mother he was bringing her home. So they made arrangements to meet at a mall in Washington, and he was arrested on the spot. But that isn't why I call Daniel Doobie a strange character. I use the word specifically because Daniel started a cult when he convinced multiple people that he was the reincarnation of Jesus Christ. Oh, boy. The FBI investigated Daniel while he was living in Hawaii in 2001. Daniel was described as a David Koresh type figure, which leads us to a side note in a side note. Oh, I love that. David Koresh was the leader of the Branch Davidians, an apocalyptic religious movement. Koresh claimed that he was the final prophet, which somehow got him a lot of devoted followers. In the early 90s, former Branch Davidian members accused Koresh of child abuse and polygamy. The FBI got involved and found the group was stockpiling weapons. The ATF raided Koresh's compound in Waco, Texas on February 28th, 1993. They initially were attempting to serve a search and arrest warrant, but a gunfight ensued, which resulted in the deaths of four government agents and six Branch Davidians. This led to a 51-day siege of the property, led by the FBI, who started their attack with tear gas. Soon the compound was engulfed in flames, and the whole thing resulted in the deaths of 86 people, including 10 government agents, two pregnant women, 25 children, and David Koresh himself. So like David Koresh, Daniel Doobie was trying to convince people he was somehow someone he's not, or in Doobie's case, Jesus. And sadly, a lot of people did somehow believe him. He got millions of dollars from faithful followers. One FBI agent described Daniel as, quote, a classic fraudster, a swindler with an uncanny ability to capture the minds of individuals who weren't as strong as he was. And I want to make it clear, I do not blame anyone that was conned out of their money. Con artists tend to be good at their jobs, and I'm disgusted that they make a living taking advantage of other people. And Daniel took advantage of many, including Geraldine Svitanovich, who was the co-founder of Herbalife. Daniel worked his magic, and within 30 days of starting a relationship with her, Daniel and Geraldine got married, and Geraldine signed over most of her real estate to Daniel. Geraldine has been stuck in legal battles for years trying to get back what is rightfully hers, and one of those properties she'd put in Daniel's name 
the house where John and Numa was hiding out in. I don't know how John and Daniel knew each other, but they were both creeps who mistreated women. So maybe they met at a group meeting. I don't know. Lord knows there's more of those out there. Mm -hmm. Uh, One of Daniel's most devoted followers was a Canadian woman who went by the name Maggie Crane and Gina Hart. To save any confusion, I'm just going to call her Maggie. Some newspapers reported that Maggie was in on everything, helping Daniel to brainwash unsuspecting victims into giving up their money. Some even referred to Maggie and Daniel as, quote, a 21st century Bonnie and Clyde, which is a fun callback to our last episode. But I don't have much to base this opinion on, but I don't think Mag, I think Maggie was as much a victim of Daniel's as anyone else that he took advantage of. She bought into his story and followed him around. She didn't get any money out of it and was in fact struggling to raise his children. So Maggie and Daniel Doobie lived together for many years. They had six children together. Daniel ends up leaving her high and dry to raise the children on her own. He's off in Thailand living with another woman that he refers to as his wife. And Maggie is kind of pissed about it, but mostly because she was deeply in love with him and wanted him back, but also upset that he wasn't giving her money to raise their children. So Maggie goes to Thailand, finds Daniel at a restaurant called Whole Earth, having lunch with his current live-in girlfriend on July 3rd, 2006. Maggie brought in a gun, shot him twice in the chest. Daniel died. Oh boy. At the time of his death, Daniel had convinced people that he was a prominent filmmaker who worked for CNN. CNN has confirmed that he did not. Daniel also claimed he was working with the United Nations during doing tsunami relief. Again, he was not. But the whole point of the two of them meeting, um, also, if you go to search him, it's like, oh, this filmmaker died. And I'm like, oh, so it's a different guy. And it's so confusing. And then you find out, no, it's the same guy. It's just he lied so many different times about what he was that Articles claim he's so many different people. It's it's wild. Um, So Maggie claims that he told her to meet him at the restaurant and that he would give her money for their kids. But when she showed up, he just verbally assaulted her and went so far as to say their sixth child wasn't biologically his. So Maggie got angry, pulled out a gun, shoots him in broad daylight. He was 56 years old. Maggie was arrested and sentenced to two years for Daniel's murder and another year and a half for possessing and carrying a pistol in public. Maggie and Daniel's oldest child, Angel Crane, then got custody of her five younger siblings who ranged in age from five to 15. Angel was just 23 at the time, which is overwhelming to think about. And as a mother, I hope that Angel was given a lot of support, and I'm talking financially, physically, emotionally, everything, while trying to raise her siblings at that yeah. time. So when police found John Anuma, he was living in a swanky house in Hawaii. And when police started to zero in on him, Daniel Doobie, the owner of the house, didn't like police hanging around so much. So he kicked John out, who then went to live with his girlfriend, Momi Durand at 3030 Kahili Street in Honolulu. A quick Momi side note. Momi ran a daycare out of her home. She contacted the TV show Extreme Home Makeover. Shout out Ty Pennington. Yes. uh, And told them a sob story about what a disarray her daycare is, etc. The show flew out the entire production to Hawaii and created Extreme Makeover Hawaii Edition. There is an episode somewhere on YouTube that shows Momi getting a new house complete with rec center for her daycare. For those looking for it, Momi is listed as the Akana family. So after this house has been built and after the show has aired and all of that, it comes out Momi's yearly income 
is roughly $200,000. Oh, boy. Which I'm sorry. If you make that much a year, fix the house yourself. Don't go to a show that could give it to someone who genuinely needs it. Yep. Uh, A month after he was evicted, John calls the property manager and asks to get back in the house. He's told no. John said he had left a briefcase hidden in the attic. The manager still won't let him in, so John told the manager exactly where to find it. The manager goes up to the attic, gets the briefcase, and out of curiosity opens it, and it's full of articles about Kristen Modafferi. And John, why would you collect articles about Kristen's case if you weren't involved in any way? Again, he claims to have never met her. Jill Lampo also claims she never met Kristen and said she can't prove whether or not John ever met her either. Jill Lampo says that she's she can't possibly have been involved in Kristen's disappearance because Jill was at the library that day. But since we don't know what time of day Kristen actually disappeared, then the library excuse isn't valid. Nope. Not to mention... Kristen had recently received mail from the library and was in possession of two library books. So is it possible that Kristen met Jill Lampo at the library? I don't know which library either attended, but I want to believe police have looked into that angle because I thought of it right away. I need to believe police have as well. Yeah. Uh, In June 2012, it seems as though Jill had a bit of a nervous breakdown. It turns out Jill has a rather tragic backstory. When Jill's mother, Debbie, got pregnant, she wasn't interested in having a baby. Some say the pregnancy was from a rape. Some say Debbie was a sex worker at the time. I could not confirm either scenario. But Debbie didn't want the baby. So when the baby was born on July 10th, 1971, Debbie and her brother went to the grocery store and left the baby in the back seat of their car. They went in, did some shopping, and when they came out, they claimed, oh my God, somebody left a baby in our car. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, The story was broadcast on the news, and a family watching, the Lampo family, uh, contacted police and said they would happily take that baby into their home. So Jill gets abandoned the day she was born. And 40 years later, she finally tracks down her birth mother. However, just as the day she was born, Debbie wants nothing to do with Jill, which is sad to see Jill get rejected by her mother a second time. This happened in 2011. Then June 2012, Jill calls her uncle, Anthony Romo, to wish Anthony's son a happy birthday. Then Jill has a bit of a breakdown and starts confessing all these things to her uncle, who just inexplicably starts taking notes. Jill confides in him that when she was living in San Francisco, she was dating a very controlling man who convinced her to participate in, quote, an unspeakable kidnap and murder. Now, of course, this brings up a lot of questions. Have the police looked further into this? Has Jill given any more details? Did she give the name or at least a description of the victim? Has she given any sort of proof, such as location of the body? Would someone admit they were an accomplice to a major crime if they weren't? And once again, in this case, I have a ton of questions and no one seems to have an answer for me. And a weird connection, Jill broke up with her boyfriend, Matthew LeCue, in order to date John Anuma. Matthew LeCue is close friends with Kelly Strathman, who was one of Kristen's co-workers at Spinelli's. About a month after Kristen went missing, Kelly got Matthew a job at the coffee shop. It's probably not connected to the disappearance, but it's a weird coincidence that I have to bring up. Yeah. Another coincidence that I don't like is that at the time of Kristen's disappearance, Jill Lampo and John Anuma were living on the 500 block of O'Farrell Street, which is approximately 0.7 miles or 1.1 kilometers from the Crocker Galleria, where Kristen worked. Police never found enough evidence to officially arrest John Anuma. The FBI said they have 
cleared both John Anuma and Jill Lampo as persons of interest in the case. However, the Oakland Police Department says they haven't cleared anybody. Uh huh. According to the National Missing and Unidentified Persons Database, more than 600,000 people go missing in the United States every year. A large percentage of these cases are resolved fairly quickly. They are, there are also 4,400 4, unidentified bodies recovered every year. I can't imagine how difficult the job must be to try and put a name to a face, especially when you don't have a DNA to compare it to. Uh, in, two, in 2022, there are currently 2,133 pe- people missing in the state of California. One such case involves Sydney Caitlin West, a 19-year-old freshman at UC Berkeley, when she went missing in the fall of 2020. On September 30th, Sydney was last seen near the Golden Gate Bridge around 6.45 a.m. She was reported missing October 1st in North Carolina, where she normally lived, and then reported missing in San Francisco the next day. Sydney got to the Golden Gate Bridge that morning using a rideshare service. There has been no activity on any of her accounts, including her bank account, phone, and social media. Sydney's cell phone has also not been found. The backpack she was seen with uh, was found near the bridge. Police have reviewed video footage from on and around the bridge. Unfortunately, intense fog obstructed most of the angles, so it was impossible to see exactly where or how Sydney left the bridge. The video has not been released to the public for security reasons, but the bridge was full of cyclists, joggers, commuters, etc. So it's surprising that no one has come forward as a witness. Due to the pandemic, all of her classes were being held online, which caused some problems for Sydney as she suffered from depression. For the sake of her mental health, she chose to defer until February 2021, staying with family friends in the area until she was ready to return to school. What I find interesting are the similarities between Kristen and Sydney. They're close in age. They were both attending UC Berkeley. They were both visiting from North Carolina. I'm not saying their cases are connected in any way, just that they have similarities. Kristen and Sydney's cases are just two of the many missing persons cases that are currently open in the United States. It is heartbreaking. Uh, Now, before you all decide on your official theories as to what may have happened to Kristen Modafferi, I should let you know the update that occurred in 2015, 18 years after Kristen's disappearance. In June 2015, the Modafferis hired former police detective Paul Dosti and his cadaver dog, a black lab named Buster, to check the Jane Avenue house where Kristen had been living in Oakland. Buster has a big reputation in cold cases, and he has helped find the remains of almost 200 people. He was also useful in finding the scent of human remains at the Flores residence in the Kristen Smart case. Oh, wow. Buster was brought to 274 Jane Avenue, when he, where he detected the scent of human remains at the end of a drainage pipe downhill from the house, as well as in the house's basement. Dr. Arpad Voss a forensic anthropologist from the University of Tennessee was brought in to do some testing in February 2017. Voss scanned the basement as well as the outside of the home with a device he created which detects human decomposition chemicals. He was able to confirm the trace of human decomposition in the soil in the basement. Under the concrete slab is hard packed clay, so it's unlikely that someone is buried in the basement but investigators believe a crime occurred in that house and then the body was moved. Dr. Voss's test also found a chemical signature denoting the presence of human blood found between the house and the house next door at the base of the porch steps of 278 Jane Avenue. According to Paul Dosti, DNA tests revealed the sample found matched Robert and Deborah Modafferi. Dosti suggested to police to excavate excavate the concrete slab that is under the porch steps, but the police said they need to do their own tests on the house to confirm the findings. If Oakland police have done any tests since, that information has not been made public. 
In November 2000, Kristen's Act was approved by the Senate to authorize the Attorney General to provide grants to organizations to find missing adults. It authorized $1 million per year to be put towards uh, to the support of missing persons organizations, including the National Center for Missing Adults. Federal funding ran out in 2005, but Kristen's Act was reauthorized in 2009. Uh, the reauthorization of Kristen's Act was meant to, quote, allow the Attorney General to make grants to public agencies or nonprofit private organizations to maintain a national resource center and information clearinghouse for missing and unidentified adults. It will also provide training to law enforcement agencies, state and local governments, and nonprofit organizations. In December 2000, one of the Modafferi neighbors created the Kristen Foundation, which provides emotional support and assistance to families who are searching for missing adults. As of May 17, 2022, the cases of Kristen Modafferi and Sydney West remain unsolved. I cannot begin to imagine what their families have gone through over these years. To quote Kristen's youngest sister, Megan, who was just seven when her sister disappeared, in 2017, Megan said, quote, you grieve, but you don't let go because it almost feels like betrayal to imagine that she's gone before you know for sure, which again is heartbreaking. So way to bring us down at the end, Oxborough. Uh, I can only hope uh, that whoever knows what happened to Kristen and Sydney or anyone that I have mentioned today will finally come forward so their families can ultimately get the closure that they deserve. Reporting for True Crime and Cocktails, I'm Christy Oxborough. I love that you say you're bringing us down. I want to remind you, I have cried at the end of multiple episodes that I have researched on this show. So I think you're doing great. But, but you're also a delight that says things like ass to ass. I've now <laughs> said it more than you have just because I found it so funny. Listen, we are who we are. Uh, let's take one more quick break, grab another drink, hit the can again, and then we're going to come back. And I have some very, very strong feelings uh, in terms of theories. Uh, so you're not going to want to miss that on this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. All right, here's that final clap. Ready? Yep. One, two, three. Welcome back to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're, of course, talking about the case of Kristen Modafferi. I'm going to get into my thoughts real quick here. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I Right from the beginning, you were talking about how she, she was moving out at 18, and I was like, so young. And then I realized I moved out when I was 18. So I was like, well, but I guess for, and I know that she was only going for a few months, but there is something about going across the country that feels I don't know if it, I, I guess I'm an old lady now. I'm a Nana now that I'm like, I only moved two hours away from home, but the, across the country, that feels extreme. Oh, um, us at 18 versus us now, us now would tan those hides. Oh yeah. 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 You know? like, what are you thinking? Yeah. Come on. Um, okay. So many things. And I'm going to go all over the maps with these theories because I kept leaning one way and then you'd give me something else. And then I'd lean that way. So go with me on this wild ride. Sure. The roommates, I'm going to start there. Why didn't they report her missing? They called her parents before they called the police. And that feels questionable to me. Why were the police being called in North Carolina before they were being called in Oakland? It's also interesting to me when you brought up uh, that other missing gal, uh, I believe it was Sydney West. Yeah. How she was reported missing in North Carolina before she was reported missing in, in California. Like yeah. that's odd to me. Um, I understand that they at first, and then when we found out the specific that, okay, she had, she had not come home at least once we know, or, or at least once it's right. been corroborated. So the roommate saying like, well, it had happened before. So we didn't panic. Okay. I can kind of give them that then. But to me, after it's been a few days, and you found out that she hadn't shown up to work. I think you you call the police and you call the parents or you you do them in quick succession. Like it seems yeah. odd to me that that there was, you know, and them saying like, oh, we didn't want to rat her out. The ages of those roommates were too old in my or the, at least a couple of them were too old to be worrying about that kind of thing. 21, 28, 25, 24. There's a 28 year old man. That is a man. You're a man when you're 28. Yeah. I mean, some, you know, some people would say to the contrary, but you're old enough at, as a 20, I think you're old enough at any of those ages, but certainly as a 28 year old 
a, a young gal, 18, new to town, hasn't been there that long, couple of weeks, isn't showing up, isn't at work. Where's the sense here? Like, and again, I'm not, it just, to me again, it rings alarm bells when now we're dealing with what we're very tragically dealing with because it, it seems odd to me if they were all 18 to 20 ish in age, I go, oh, okay, like whatever. But you had a 25 year old, a 28 year old, like why wasn't there any voice of reason going guys who fucking cares if we're ratting on her to her parents, what 28 year old is caring about ratting on an 18 year old. Do you know what I mean? Like, True. even if you don't have the sense or compassion to care about her as a human, why didn't you go, um, this could be bad for us. We need to make sure that we make a phone call. Now, we're four men who are all older than her. Some of us a lot older than her, not that age yeah. matters, but, but four men who recently welcomed a 18-year-old girl from far, from across the country as our fifth roommate, and she's now missing. To me, it's odd that no one thought I'm being crass, but I'm, again, this is, I'm, I'm just stating facts, you know, sure. um, that no one thought we need to cover our asses if they were innocent. Sure. You know what that I'm saying? Sense. Like to me, it's just, it's, it's, I would hope that they would lead with altruism and humanity, of course, and caring about the fact that this gal has gone missing. But, but you know what I'm saying? That it's like, if nothing else, it's like, none of you thought about the fact that this is going to look very questionable on all of you. I think it's a little questionable, yeah. to be honest, that the four of them were like, let's take in this 18-year-old girl. That's a recipe for disaster. Not that I'm suggesting that four men, that means that they're going to automatically be inappropriate with an 18-year-old. But they're all, but now, 2022, I think four dudes that are of those ages, certainly 25, 28, I don't know that yeah. they're going to be like the 18-year-old girl when there's four adult men in here. I don't know that they're going to be like, that's the best choice. Oh, just because yeah. again, it's like, I don't know. Again, I'm not saying that, that every, that no man, you know, that every time that means that something bad's going to happen, but you know what I'm saying? It just feels like it's like a recipe for disaster is my point. Um, here's something I thought of. So you mentioned that she had that classified ad that they found thrown out in her room. Yes. And that the phone number was disconnected. Yes. Couldn't they have gone, this is 1997. Couldn't yes. they have gone through the phone records, at least in the house and say at her workplace and seen if that number had been called? Did they check the phone records? That would, I mean, it makes sense that they would. Because at that time, I mean, at least where we were, you, you definitely could. You definitely had, your landline had a record of every number that you called. Right. So it's just interesting to me because it felt like there was this question mark about like, well, we don't know. And it's like, well, did you check? Like, did, did you check to see if she'd maybe called or somebody in the house had called that number? Right. Cause she wouldn't have had a cell phone at the time. So it should be unlike, I mean, she could have, but it, it, I mean, cell phones again, did exist at that time, but not like they do now, obviously. But again, sure. I'm just saying like, did you at least check to see if that number had been called from that house that landline we know there was a landline at that at that house right to me that was a question mark now you're gonna love this this is the number one clue and i know what you're gonna say you're gonna say ash you're already out on a batshit tangent how is this possible <laughs> i can't wait but hear me out yes the number one clue i heard anonymous donator Donor donates numerous billboards. Who? Why? Why anonymous? Think about this psychologist hat. If you are somebody who has committed this crime and you are, uh, you know, sociopath, psychopath, narcissist, there's lots that would sure. fall under this umbrella. You would love, absolutely love to have multiple large billboards around where you potentially are at the time, reminding the world of what you are getting away with, which is potentially, allegedly, 
tragically ending this beautiful young life and getting away with it, right? Because a big thing about narcissists, true narcissists, we're not throwing it around, is they have a God complex. They believe that they're smarter than everybody, that they're getting away with things in plain sight. So skipping ahead for a second here, I start, it started to come up again and again for me when we started to look at some of these different possible theories of, of people who could be involved. Robert Durst, first of all, I love this theory. Robert Durst, to me, when he said on that tape, <laughs> so many things, but killed them all, of course. That, to me, the wording of that. Now, I know that he was you know, sputtering a lot of things. There was potential some mental health happening in that moment. But at that time, we knew that he had probably killed his wife, Susan, and his roommate at the boarding house. Yeah. I'm not saying that you wouldn't refer to three people as all, but what struck me when I watched that documentary years ago was that I was like, would we say that if referring to only three killed them all? To me, the human nature of an English speaker, I know it would vary region to region, but would be killed all three. Like, like to me, killed all, killed them all. My gut in that moment was like, he's killed more than three. That's just what I felt in that moment. So to me, the fact that there could be this string of other people, the fact that we're seeing a potential pattern, the fact that the gals are similar, potentially he picked up um, this first one at his, at his health food store. The fact that the other two, the fact that we know that Kristen got into people's cars multiple times and took rides, and we knew that Karen was seen getting into a car with somebody that did match Robert's description is it possible? Again, that's an MO. What else do we know about Robert Durst? We know he had money. We know that he had money squirreled away in all kinds of places. That could be somebody who would have the money to pay anonymously for multiple billboards. Just saying. Oh, great point. Right? I and also then- uh, agree with you and your uh, killed them all. If he had just said, I killed them. Yeah. And left it at that, then it's like, okay. But the fact that he chose to say all somehow makes it feel bigger than just them. Yeah. And you it's say they, say- them, because they're the ones that they mentioned to you. You say all when it's those ones and ones you don't know about. Right. You know? Yes. Yeah. And it's a semantics game for sure. Absolutely. But I think the psychology of it, and because again, a different person, it could go either way. I think that person in that moment, given everything that's going on, to me, I, I think it, that there is something there. I, I always thought back then. And then this was amazing for me because I was like, I've always had this theory and now I'm hearing that there could be other people. Um, okay, so then again, I'm jumping all around here, but because I'm fixated on the billboards. Um, the next one as well, John. John, sorry, his last name is not in front. John Onuma. John Onuma. So we know that John Onuma had the connection to the classified ads. We know that he was luring women with classified ads. So how do we know that he wasn't the one in the classified ad that they found in Kristen's room? Now, I know that doesn't have to do with the billboards, but I just saw that in my notes and I was like excited to get that out. Of course. But again, there's something in that to me now. Go with me on this again. I know I'm really taking a stretch out there. Is it possible? He was friends with this this Doobie character, this Daniel Doobie character, who we knew had a ton of money. Is it possible that he fronted the money for these billboards for John? Is that possible? Sure. That John was like, I need this cash, whatever. Can you help me out, et cetera? We also know... um, that his, his next girlfriend was also arguably a little scammy. She makes 200 K a year. She wanted to get on the extreme makeover show. So she made it sound like she didn't. I don't know how much they spent on these billboards, but what I do know is that's another person who has money. It just seemed to me again, like he had people in his life that could have also potentially been involved in paying for these billboards. Um, Anyway, I digress for a second, but it's to me, that is, if I was like FBI profiling, which as you know, is, would be a goddamn dream of mine. Um, <laughs> that to me, there's some, that's where I would start. 
Go after who anonymously paid for those billboards. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, that's not common. How often do we hear about like, we've covered enough cases. Have we covered them all? Of course of not. Of course. There's sadly billions. But yes. I have never once, this is the first time I have ever, ever, ever heard that an anonymous donator, donator, um, donor specifically donated billboards. Weird. Yeah. Why that? To me, there's just some, something that's so grandiose about that that doesn't sit with me. I'm like, that. that's to me, I just think there's something in that. Could be wrong, but also could be right. Um, there's also something interesting to me, and you may not know the answer to this, but Dennis Mann, we know that he was, was just a citizen who decided to follow this case, research this case. And we know that one of the things he did was he went to Thailand to follow a lead, correct? Yes. Isn't it also interesting that Daniel Doobie ended up in Thailand? Now, I don't know if the timeline would have overlapped for them to have been there at the same time, but it just seems interesting to me that both of them went to live there and then Daniel Doobie did die there. It just feels like an odd coincidence. And is it a coincidence? Is it possible they were there at the same time? Is it possible go with me, that Daniel Doobie knew, mm -hmm. knew this other gentleman and allegedly is this other gentleman, you know, invested in throwing people off the scent of John Onuma as a favor to Daniel Doobie. Sure, sure. I mean, again, that's, that's, now we're getting real bad shit, but, you know. I mean, I know that Daniel went to Thailand I know he was there after Daniel was killed because he went there specifically to speak with Maggie about killing him. Oh, interesting. And you only get so much time a day to be able to speak to, um, uh, to speak to prisoners. And he was like, well, it's not worth it to fly there just for the 15 minutes you're allowed a day. So he gave up his life essentially and moved to Thailand to be able to like build a rapport with Maggie. Why is he so interested in this case? I just also don't know what could Maggie know that would be worth uprooting yourself and going to Thailand so that you can have 15 minutes a day with her. Like I, yeah, that's interesting. Well, listen, that blows my theory out of the water, but, let, but I, but it brings up a new one, which is, yeah. What is, what is his interest? And I know that he's also got interest in some other cases, but I don't know. That's odd to me. It's, it's pretty extreme to uproot your life, quit your job and move to another country to talk to someone who's peripherally connected to someone who is kind of connected to someone who's maybe a suspect. Yeah. Well, interesting. Um, okay. The only other things that I wanted to touch on very quickly. Oh, in terms of the runaway theory, I just automatically go back to Gacy and, and I'm so triggered by that because the police said that to so many of those parents of those boys that it was like, he's just run away. He's just run away. And it was like, mm -mm, it's just lazy. And I, so I don't buy that at all. I don't buy that for a second. Um, I will say too, she did have a routine. And as, as we've, heard before at certain times, unfortunately, having a very set specific routine can make you a bit of a target. Um, so that's interesting to me. Um, this blonde woman is interesting to me. Was she connected in some way? The burping. Um, oh, that oh the my burping. God. I can't. I, Again, to me, it's interesting that Jill had this breakdown. Jill Lampo had this breakdown where she said that she was involved in a kidnapping and a murder. It's interesting that then we also know that John had the briefcase full of articles about Kristen. The fact that we know that he placed classified ads to lure women. And we, we know that Kristen did have that classified ad in her room. We also don't know what his ads potentially were. But it does seem to me that if he was making it sound like young woman loves hiking and music and art and whatever, and did he use Jill as kind of the face of the grift where the, you know, sure. 
whoever, Kristen, now I'm just speculating, shows up to meet this person, meets Jill. She's nice. Um, and then that's, was that part of her involvement? Did she help in the luring when she, she, you know, said this to her uncle about, she was involved in this situation. Right. Was that how she was involved? Was she, was that a part of it? I mean, again, I'm just, I'm throwing all of this out here. Um, I, it, it feels again, I don't want to say, because again, at the beginning, I was just like, I feel like the, I feel like the roommate said something to do with it. Then all of this, I'm like, I feel like it has to have been John. But then the stuff about the cadaver dog is interesting to me because as you were saying all of this, I was like, yeah, but how do we know it was specifically Kristen? We just know that there is a body there. But then the fact that this other test was done and it matched her parents' DNA, then what? Um, there's just some, there's something else here that we're not seeing. You know what I mean? It's like, there's something else to me that's, that's just, it's, it feels like it's in plain sight and we're not seeing it. And, and to that, I say, and this is the last thought I'll leave you with. It's a classic Lauren Ash thought. Is there some element of they all did it? Is there some aspect? Because why does John have this obsession with her that he's bringing her name up? that he's using her to try and, you know, infiltrate or sorry, implicate um, these two other women that worked with Jill. He's got the clippings in his briefcase. Like, is he just, you know, one could say, is there just a mental health issue happening there? But then the fact that multiple women have come forward saying that they were scared to come forward because he had tortured them and did these horrific things to him, to them, yeah. sleep deprivation, all these things. You know as well as I do, that type of behavior doesn't tend not to escalate. If you're sure. starting with, with luring, torturing, doing all these things to women, we've done enough of this show to know, typically you're gonna escalate to doing a kill. Is it possible again that it somehow happened in that house? And then those, those roommates were like, fuck, we're, it's going to look like it was us. How do we handle this? Is that possible? I mean, I don't know. Again, I, I don't know the answer to that. I throw that out as a, as a, there's, there's no answer to that question, but it just feels interesting to me because there's so many signs that feel like they point to John Onuma. But then when you add in the bit about the, the cadaver dog and then finding something that matches her DNA potentially, or at least her parents, I don't know what to say to that. And then, of course, there's also the theory, obviously, that I didn't really touch on, that she had just potentially sadly fallen off the cliff. Um, I feel like there's enough smoke here that I don't know that that's what this is. Sometimes it feels like the simplest answer is true. That doesn't feel like this to me. And the fact that we know also that she had gone on that path two days prior or whatever it is, yeah, it kind of makes that, unfortunately, it, it makes that a little bit um, of a moot point because- if we know for sure she was there two days prior, the scent, I feel like, you know, it's, it's, it could still be the same scent from that visit. Um, but anyway, I don't know what your thoughts are. I don't know if I've, if I've, uh, you know, if I've inspired anything in you, but this one really, it feels like it's so close to me. Like it feels like the answer is so close that I feel like that's why it's really confounding me because I feel like there's just like one detail that would blow it open. Oh, a hundred percent. There is something and I don't know what it is I mean when you look at everybody that it could be like I'm I'm so skeptical of four adult men living with an 18 year old girl um it's just like was it did something happen was there some sort of accident and they just did a really terrible job of covering it up. And then it's like, why does John Anuma, like, why would you have a briefcase full of articles about her? That's weird. Why would you rip diary pages out of your girlfriend's diary because it's incriminating? For the love of God, Jill, what? Kidnap and murder. Was it? 
has she since recanted that and been like, oh, I, yeah, I didn't mean that. He can't prove that. And also just be like, well, I obviously wasn't part of anything to do with her disappearance. I was at the library. It's like, but we didn't say what time. Yeah. It's like when you invite someone to a party and they don't want to go and they're like, oh, I can't go. And you're like, I didn't tell you what day it was. It's also a you know? little odd to me that a letter shows up at the house for her. They claim that they were not super worried about her being missing, but they were so worried that they opened the first letter that arrived for her. And also, like, if it's from the library, you would think that it would be on a library stationary envelope. Sure. Like, why would that be the thing? It's just odd to me. There's just, again, there, there feels like there's details throughout that don't add up, which makes it feel, again, like it's like, they all did it in the sense of, you know, is somebody covering for something that doesn't actually mean that they were involved in her disappearance, but in covering for something else, it's covering, you know what I mean? Like, sure. Um, the only other thing I will offer, this just came to me. We know that Robert Durst was living at least part-time at a shelter for people without housing, the one that Karen worked at. Right. We know that. So, so is it possible that he knew people through that place or social programs or, or whatever that were living at the house next door to Kristen and the roommates where we know again, that the trail from the cadaver dog led, right. is it possible? Is it possible again, go with me. Is it possible that they knew John? Is it possible that that there was a connection there too? If this is somebody who's using utilizing classified ads to lure people, to lure women, to torture them, is there some sort of, God knows, but you know what I mean? Like, is there some way that there's, there's a couple of these different things that are connected? Yes. I know sure. I'm using my fucking clue there. They all did it theory, but it just, again, it just seems, it just feels, it feels like there's, there's no clear answer. And truthfully, it feels like often when we do these, there's usually one suspect that it feels like, well, like that. but this one, it's like, I don't know. It, yeah. I mean, one of my, one of the big things for me that I can't really get past Robert Durst. I'm, I mean, I'm fully believe he killed his wife and his friend and the neighbor, but like, the neighbor, he obviously didn't do a great job covering that. But how? How did he pull off murdering his wife and, like, there's no sign of her? How I, has I've he often pulled thought that of that? I just can't. Like, he had to have had help or something because I just don't know how. Like, he seems too scattered mentally to, like, be able to come up with a plan and pull it off. But when did the scatter, when did the scatter um, start? Oh, that's a great point. Probably when he started peeing in a garbage can at work. <laughs> like when he was living his life, having the, the, what was it? The, the health, the health food store or whatever it was, maybe he was one way. And then over time, something happened. I don't know. It's just. Like with Susan, shoots her and then just leaves her there and sends the police a letter, admits to sending the letter, which then it admits, you know, the you saw the body. Dude, it's just, it's so painful. And then admits to dismembering after self-defense. Well, nobody's self-defense. If he was just dead, self-defense. Sure, try it. Self-defense and you then felt the need to cut up the body that's that's outrageous <laughs> and then he did a terrible yes, job is. of it hiding is. any and all evidence whereas with his first wife just no sign of her oh what? but if we bulldoze that that cottage well yeah but here's my other question what year did he kill he killed his roommate. Look, 
he he killed his wife. He killed his wife years years prior, prior like to 1992. Right. Allegedly speculating. Of We're course. just going with this theory. He would have killed Kristen and uh Karen in 97. He yeah. would not have killed the other two, the the roommate or Susan Berman until after 2000. So so it's possible it's possible there's also many more oh it's possible that again like he he had his own mo with his with his first wife with these other gals with other people and then either he got sloppy he had a mental health issue that was causing something else to be added in sure. on top of the all the already existing mental issues or it can also be I you I have seen this in serial killers. They they it's not necessarily that they get sloppy, but they get cocky. So it's like it's almost like with depending on the person. Yeah, it's like I wrote a letter that I whatever because again with the true narcissist, it's like he can do that and they're not going to catch me. Right. Like, I'm so smart that I can do this and it's fine. Like, yeah, I dismembered him. That doesn't prove anything. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, it's like, yeah. it is interesting to think about the fact that this could, this did happen potentially. If, if it did happen, it was prior to those, those, for lack of a better term, sloppier crimes. So it, and again, they've never sure. found the first body. That is true. Assumed to be the first body. There could have been bodies before that. We don't know. Right? Like it's true. It's, it's just interesting to me that. Yeah, I don't know. To me, that that it's another sign that says could be possible. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Like there was a chunk of time, like six years in the 90s, where it said like he just traveled around the country. And so it, I'm dying to see just just give me an approximate time and place because I want to track missing persons in all of those places to see, is there, you know, a teenage girl that's gone missing in all of the places where he had been. Another, a hundred percent. Another important thing to remember. It was after 2000 that he moved to Texas when he started living as the mute woman. And right. I only offer that because it feels like a, that was kind of an, an extreme or eccentric choice. Sure. Um, I think that's a fair statement. Uh, given that his rationale was like, this is how they won't catch me. And it's like posing as a mute in general. I mean, I'm not saying that, I mean, this is, I, I'm sure that there is a much larger percentage of people who don't speak than I realize, but to me, that makes you stand out more. Do you know what I'm saying? So it's like, it was a, it was a sure. very kind of specific choice. My question is, was that the beginning of perhaps this additional mental health crisis? Um, and is there something in, if you're spending time, and I believe in that time, and I could be wrong, but I think he would talk in private to his boarding house mate, the one that he killed. I think he sure. would put down the veneer and talk, but I might be wrong. Um, but did he drive himself further into madness for lack of a better term by spending so much time, not speaking, living in the, do you know what I mean? Like, was that a part of it? I don't know. It's more than possible, but I agree with you. I think it would be interesting to track his kind of movements where we know he was living at the time and try and, and see if there is a correlation to, to missing, um, gals certainly that fit this same kind of profile because- Oh yeah, That's I'm odd. I'm convinced of it. I just need the time. I need the time to find I know. it. But also, I don't think it's ever going to be possible to have a because I can't just go with an area. I need also a time. Yes, to be able you, to match it up. But what you need is a police computer, and that's yeah, a dream. Christy yeah. Oxborough, amazing work. This one again has truly rattled me. I I'm going to be thinking about this for until further notice because I really am just to the core of my being rattled. Uh, amazing work as always. You never cease to amaze. You are too kind. Well, that's an award-winning researcher over there. So. <laughs>
Uh, and thank you, dear listeners, for joining us on this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. Uh, if you'd like to give us a follow on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at True Crime and Cocktails, on Twitter at Not Detectives. And if you'd like a little bit more, go to patreon.com slash True Crime and Cocktails, where you can sign up for additional bonus episodes, live monthly Q&As, a monthly poll, all kinds of great things. And the only place for official True Crime and Cocktails merch is truecrewmerch.com. So also check that out if you haven't as of yet. Christy, do you want to tell the people about next week's episode? On the next True Crime and Cocktails, Malcolm Webster. I don't have any idea about Malcolm <laughs> Webster, and I am jazzed to learn. Can't wait for that. Uh, do you want to say goodnight to the people? Good night, Paul Rudd. Oh, good night, future time traveling us. <laughs>